Welcome, everyone. Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. As a courtesy to the presenters, please mute all mobile devices. Everyone, please welcome back Chet Haas. Morning from the very much less than full room. I assume people had fun at the party last night and that those people are not here. Uh, welcome back to the conference. So favorite things you've seen so far? Shout it out. You. <laughs> I owe you 10 bucks. Let's make that five. Anything else? Motion layout. Motion layout. Low, latency audio. Low latency audio. That was cool. I love the live coding of C++ in that like, really quick talk. That was, that was very brave, and it worked out very well. Uh, Annie was the DJ at the thing last night, too. Uh, yes, anything else? Custom linting. Custom linting. All right. I will tell Tor. He owes you 10 bucks. <laughs> GSI. Uh, yes, generic system images, right, excellent. Lightning talks, yes or no? Yes, works. All right, people had a problem with it, no? All right, so I think the yeses win. Sorry, we're going to ignore you. Uh, excellent, what are you looking for today? You. <laughs> All right, well, we solved that one. You, you are beginning to regret that. Anything else? Uh, vitals, yes. Text, firesides, that'll be interesting. Uh, all right, well, we, the only change that I know about on the schedule, there was a little bit of an awkward thing with the talk that was supposed to happen about now. Um, Jake had to go home because apparently babies, unlike software, occasionally ship early. <laughs> so he made a quick departure last night onto a plane and went home. So we have a different talk for you this morning. It is on the schedule. Hopefully you noticed that. If you really wanted to see Jake, I'm really going to disappoint you. And you are welcome to see the other talk uh, about uh, screen, other screen form factors in the other room. Otherwise, uh, let me bring on the next speakers for the next talk. Romain Guy. Did you just call me a disappointment? <laughs> I appreciate that. Now, it, it, Chad didn't tell you the real story. We were part of the content selection committee for this event, and somehow we end up, ended up with no talk to give, so we had to do something about it. <laughs> Unbelievably complicated to arrange this, but yeah. his wife was in on it, uh, so <laughs> it all worked out. And now we're here. So, we would like to present a talk not about R8 and D8. However, there are people on the team, including the team lead, important engineers on the team, uh, that know all about R8 and D8. So if that is really what you want to know about at the conference, you have that opportunity. They are in the Android Studio office uh, hours area. Mads in particular. Mads in particular, also JVG. Uh, so yes, um, check them out. Uh, sorry, Jeffrey Van Gogh. Uh, check them out in the Android Studio area. So please chase down that information. We're going to talk about something completely different. We're going to talk about trash. So why are we going to talk about trash? Here, why don't we, yeah, let me, let me try this here. All right, so there's a common phrase in software, garbage in, garbage out, but nobody ever says how fast. So we're going to talk about that today, and why? Because 
Back at I.O., we had this talk that we gave called Modern Android Development. I have to apologize for the sunglasses. The sun was right there, right there, really annoying, couldn't see a thing. Sunglasses didn't actually help, nor did they make us look any better. Um, so we talked about many things. You know, Android uh, had certain development practices way back then, and Android has changed, and devices have changed, and ecosystems have changed, and now we are recommending different practices. All the stuff that you may have known about Android development may not necessarily be true today. One of the things that we talked about in particular was a lot about memory and garbage collection. We had certain recommendations there. Um, so, for example, we said back in the Dalvik days, uh, Dalvik was optimized for size. It was meant to fit in a very small area. It didn't have a lot of area to do things like AOT. It didn't have a place to stash the code. really needed to constrain memory. The optimizations were not optimal. Allocations collections, unbelievably expensive. You get GC for alloc all the time, causing jank all over the place. Heap fragmentation was a problem. So really, the recommendation was to not really allocate anything ever if you could possibly help it. Uh, and use primitive types everywhere because objects are expensive because you're allocating them. Avoid auto-boxing, all this stuff. Yes, so I need to correct you once again. You say avoid allocations whenever possible, enums. They don't allocate. Yeah, okay, well... That's the whole point. But, 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 <laughs> but they take up space, right? So that's what, one to two K uh, compared you can't to, you, you can't know, save it, fields. Just move on. All right, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's memory related. <coughs> So the recommendation instead was uh, pay attention to art because it turns out art is optimized for performance. It's actually getting faster with every release because the whole platform was built to be able to optimize more and more uh, the more the team works on it. Uh, we're doing JIT as well as AOT, so we compile this code, we find out where the hotspots are, and we stash this code somewhere um, so we can run that faster next time you go through that loop. Uh, allocations and collections are much, much faster. We'll go into details about this. Uh, we're, we have the ability to defragment the heap and actually compact as we go now. And there's a large object heap, which makes some of the allocations amazingly faster and simpler than they used to be. So the new recommendations are Go ahead and allocate. It's really not that big a deal anymore. Um, still be concerned for inner loop situations and uh, be aware that you are actually causing the device to do stuff. You are causing uh, battery and CPU usage. So you still want to be aware of these things, um, but maybe they're not such a big deal that they should affect your APIs and your development patterns the way that they used to. However, that was like a lot of really terse information stuffed into a very short amount of time. So we thought maybe we should do this talk to actually explain ourselves a little more completely and say, why is this the case? Maybe talk about uh, what art has done to make life better. The original idea for the talk was actually, OK, well, we said all this stuff, but wouldn't it be nice if we could just write a bunch of demo applications and show benchmarks and say, this is why, and these are the canonical results that prove our premise. And it turns out that is really hard. Because garbage collection, by its nature, especially in art, is concurrent. There's stuff happening in the background all the time. And if you want to trigger that thing right now, you will not be able to. So we made an attempt to write some demo applications. You will see some of the results here. But we realized we don't really have enough canonical deterministic data to show you. So instead, we're going to tell you the background of why it's difficult to write these things, because everything is happening magically for you in the background. So first of all, let's talk about memory. We see a couple of simple lines of code here. We have a primitive type. Here's foo. We're going to set it equal to 5, and then we're going to allocate an object here. Well, there are different kinds of memory in the system and different implications. So if we're going to have a primitive type, that may show up in the stack, or it may show up in registers. Dalvik was a register-based uh, allocation system, so it would actually pop it in over there. But whether it shows up in the stack or the register, you can think of it as essentially free. It's kind of allocated at compiler time. It says, when I run this line of code, here's where I'm going to stick this thing. It didn't need to find space for it anywhere. It knows that it has space on the stack. Sort of, you can think of that as kind of limited, uh, uh, sorry, limitless storage space, as well as the registers. It'll basically find a copy hole to stash that thing. It's free. However, when you allocate any other sort of thing, when you say new object, then it needs to find space for it in the heap, which means it needs to figure out where it's going to fit among the other things that already occupy the heap. Then it'll find space down there. So that's the basic memory system of the runtime and the, and the computer overall. Uh, so the idea of garbage collection, uh, well, we've all been doing garbage collection even before higher level languages like Java and Kotlin. If you're writing C++ code, then you can do an allocation like this, and then you can use, you can write the code that actually uses that object that you've allocated. Uh, and then if you don't do anything else, you've just leaked an object. You're taking up space 
in memory somewhere that eventually is going to cause you to run out of memory, right? So what you need to do is actually free the object. So you delete the thing, you reclaim that memory. So you're basically doing manual garbage collection here. Uh, but sometimes you forget that you freed that over there, and then in this other place over there, you continue using that object, and then you crash, maybe. So very non-deterministic system. You are responsible for managing your own garbage, your own allocations and collections. Tends to be tedious, tends to be very error prone. Uh, and so higher level languages came along. So we have language like Java, where you allocate an object, and then you write the code that actually uses that thing, and then eventually it is freed. And if you continue using it, then you still have a reference to this object, which means it's going to eventually be freed without freeing it too soon. Right? The system knows what's going on. You don't have to manage this thing. It does it for you. However, if it's doing it for you, several questions occur. And there's no crash. Yay. Uh, well, ideally. Uh, so there are some things that, that naturally occur to you, such as, OK, well, how long does it take for the system to do this? Like, I know how long my malloc statement was going to take in C++, but how long is it going to take for the system to automatically find space in the heap for me? How long does it take to walk the heap, find the appropriate spot to put this thing, uh, and then allocate that space? How long does it take to actually collect these objects? When a reference goes away, when will it be collected, and how long does it take to actually collect these things? Uh, and what impact is there system-wide? So if we're running this sort of garbage collector thread, this heavyweight thing in the background, that in one, it, what impact does that have on you know, jank on the UI thread or whatever? And when do these things actually happen? And also, how efficient is that heap usage? Right? It's not just going to malloc these little tiny chunks for your things. It's probably allocating a large amount of space and then putting things in there and sorting them around. And certainly on Dalvik, as we'll see, it's fragmenting the heap over time, which means you may have a lot of memory available, but you can't necessarily even access it anymore. Um, so how efficient is that, and how much memory are you taking up in the system to do all this stuff? So we're going to start by taking a look at how Dalvik collects garbage. Uh, Dalvik was the runtime we were using until Android KitKat. It was replaced in Lollipop with Art. So this is a picture of the heap. Everything that's in white has been allocated, and we have a few holes. And we're trying to allocate this blue object. So what Dalvik is going to do is just going to walk through the heap and find a spot where the object fits. When it finds one, pretty easy, just slot it there. Things becomes, uh, become a lot more complicated when it comes uh, time to collect uh, objects. So there's four phases. The first one, Dalvik has to pause all the threads in your application to find the root set. So root sets are typically local variables, uh, threads, static variables. Uh, they're just the, the roots of all the allocations that can be reached in your application. So that takes a bit of time, and during that time, your application cannot do anything. The second phase is concurrent. Your app is running again. So from those roots, Delvik will find all the objects that can be reached and marks them as such. Unfortunately, since that, that second phase is concurrent, uh, allocations could be triggered uh, during that time. So you see here, like for instance, we're just allocating, sorry, we just, we just allocated another object. So we need to pause the application again and find the reachable objects again. And all your threads are paused, so your application stutters a little bit again. And finally, we can mark all the objects that are not reachable, and they are candidates for garbage collection. So the collection itself just gets rid of the objects in the heap. So now, if we want to allocate something in the heap, and the heap is pretty much full, and we have objects that have been, be, been marked for allocation, Dalvik will go through the heap, realize that there's no memory available, and then it will trigger a garbage collection for the specific use case of an allocation. That's the GC for alloc. And every time this happens, you see a log on KitKat. If you do in ADB logcat, you can see those GC for alloc messages. So it will you know, run the collection, get rid, get rid of this memory. Then we can run through the uh, typical allocation mechanism. However, sometimes your heap is full. Uh, there are no objects that can be collected. Every object is reachable. So Dalvik will run through the heap, can't find anything. And only two things can happen. Either the heap will grow, or your application will crash. And this, this, the, it's the out-of-memory error that you've seen, I'm sure, in a lot of your applications, uh, especially on older devices. This typically happens when you're allocating large objects. Uh, I remember a lot of uh, developers in the early days of, en of Android filed bugs against bitmap factory because out of memory error happened, ten tended to happen during uh, uh, the decoding of bitmaps. And they thought there was a memory leak in bitmap factory. The, the main reason was bitmap objects are big, and it was hard to find sp uh, space for them. Uh, there was no leak in bitmap factory whatsoever. 
So uh, we wrote a simple demo application to show off um, how some of the stuff with heap fragmentation works. So in the demo, we allocate chunks of memory all the way up to max heap. So your heap starts out very small, and then if you can't allocate an object, it's, it's going to grow that over and over and over until it reaches the max possible. So for this demo, we allocate these one meg chunks, press this button, it says there's 400 megs free. You press the button, it's going to allocate all these one meg chunks all the way until it grows the heap until it cannot anymore. You get an error, we catch the error, and now we know the heap is full, there's no space And this anywhere. is pretty much the only situation where you should do a try-catch on an out-of-memory error. Don't do that in your application. <laughs> Uh, and then we say, OK, well, there's only one meg free. Um, so we're going to go ahead and fragment the heap. Uh, and we're going to free a, a bunch of chunks. So we're basically going to go through everything we've allocated and free every other one through the entire oh, heap. So just go through every other reference, set it to null, then force the GC a couple of times to make sure that that memory goes away. And then we get this result. It says, OK, the fragmented heap size is now 200 megs. Um, so we should have plenty of space to go ahead and allocate a 2 megabyte object. So that blue object there, it's only 2 megs. We've got 200, we've got 200 megs free. Um, so what can be the problem? Uh, so we press the button, and it says, nope, we can't fit that in there. And if you look at the log, you get these depressing things here it's where it says, best error message <laughs> in all of computer science. Yes, right here. This is, this is beautiful. It says, OK, you have. Free, 200 megs free out of 400, and we're forcing a collection so that we can make room for a 2 meg chunk. And we're trying really hard to do that, and we ran out of memory. So we cannot find space for 2 megs out of 200, because apparently Dalvik was really bad at math. The problem was, of course, that we couldn't find 2 megs contiguous, and Dalvik did not have the ability to compact the heap. You get what you get. Once we put the thing there, it was not going to move, so we couldn't actually shove stuff to the side to make room for a larger object. So Art came along in Lollipop. Um, as I said, it's a platform for optimizations. It no longer had the memory constraints that Dalvik did, so they could sort of build in a lot of the fundamentals that they've been improving over time. But out of the box, it came with much faster allocation times, much faster, much faster collections, as well as a faster runtime, the ability to do ahead of time uh, compilations. So we're actually like running binary code all the time. We're not constantly jitting things to, to find how we can speed things and up, thing, make everything faster. One thing you, we need to make clear is when we talk about allocation and faster allocation in this talk, we mean just the time it takes for the runtime to reserve the memory. We're not talking about the time it takes to run the constructors. It has nothing to do with your code. It's only in the runtime itself. All right, so how did Art allocation work? So in Art, we introduced a new allocator called the ROS alloc, and I don't know what it stands for, actually. Uh, but it replaces something called DL malloc. So DL stands for Doug Lee, uh, who is also the person who wrote, I believe, java.util.concurrent. That, that's what happens if you write a really nice algorithm, then people name the algorithm. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the kind of person that makes me feel very inadequate as an engineer. Uh, really smart. Uh, anyway, DL malloc is basically the algorithm behind the malloc function call uh, in native code. So this is what you use when you call malloc or you call new in C or C++. This is the algorithm we're using. So Dalvik was relying on that. Uh, Art replaced it with its own call ROS. So the main benefit of ROS alloc is that it's thread aware. So it's able to do allocations that are specific to a thread. And we're going uh, to look at, at this in detail, uh, and you understand why it brings a lot of benefits. There's also a lot of little tweaks that have been done. So small allocations are grouped together to re reduce fragmentation. We align large allocations on pages, uh, typically four kilobytes uh, on modern OSs, and gives you better performance. Uh, also, finer grain lock, because the garbage collector has to acquire locks, uh, because you know, we have a lot of threads running. Uh, they, used to, uh, they used to protect a lot more code, so now it protects less code and runs faster. And overall, allocations with Ross malloc are four to five times faster than they were with Dalvik. Again, this is just about the act of allocating the memory. It has nothing to do with your code. You could do something really, really, really expensive in your, in your constructor, and we would not be five times faster than Dalvik. All right, so let's take a look at how allocations work on art in this new system. So, uh, oh, sorry, the, the other very, very important thing with art was the ability to deal with large objects in a much better way. So you've got this normal sized object. It's going to find a space for it in the heap over here. Um, and what happens if you have this large object? And by large object, we mean an array of primitives or string. Uh, and these are the, the types chosen because we can guarantee that these objects and will not have a reference to something else. They can live completely and on And it's their an own. array of at least 12 kilobytes. Yes. 
Uh, and that is the heuristic for now. That could change over time. But right now, it's 12K primitive types or string. Uh, so you've got this huge object. Where are we going to put it? Well, in Dalvik, we would put it where exactly, right? You can see in this fragmented heap that may, there may not be space for it. In art, it's a little bit simpler. The complicated mechanism looks like this. We just put it somewhere. We just malloc a space for it and shove it in there. It's not even in a large object bucket that holds all of them. We just allocate a space for it somewhere in there. We say, OK, you are now part of the heap, but really it's just living on its own somewhere. Very fast, very easy. Uh, it's also a moving collector, so we can actually compact things. Um, so we no longer have the fragmentation problem. Uh, however, it does this in the background. Um, uh, so actually, it's, it's a little more complicated. My understanding originally was, well, if your application goes into the background, um, then eventually this very expensive operation, it could take up to 100 milliseconds, may run that's going to compact the heap. Obviously, we don't want to run that in the foreground because we're going to jank your app all over the place. So we're going to wait till it's sitting there in the background. User is doing something else. They're not paying attention. So you're, we're compacting the heap for you. That's awesome. So I said, OK, well, I'm going to demonstrate this and show that same defragmentation uh, uh, crash error that we saw earlier. I'm going to show how it crashes on on KitKat using Dalvik, and it will also crash in all of the releases until we're able to do it in the foreground on a later release in O. Um, and this will be a cool demo. And then I ran it on L, and it didn't crash. And the thing is, yes, it will defragment in the background, but it will also do it in the foreground if it has to, which is really what you want. So if you actually need that memory now, um, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't crash? So yes, that's that what we need. The compaction is almost a replacement for the GC for alloc yep. from before. Um, so now it basically takes everything. It says, well, you need space for this really large object. We're going to go ahead and compact things and uh, then put it where we need to. So on L and above, we run the same fragmentation demo that we saw before. We go ahead and alloc up to the uh, maximum heap size. It says, yep, you've only got about one meg free. And we go ahead and free every other meg, null out those references. And then we try to find space for this two meg block, compacts the heap, and puts it in. Very simple. Uh, so another improvement. So remember, with the Dalvik GC, we had those four phases, including two pauses for your application. Um, so the pauses were bad because you know your application was not doing anything during that time. But what was even worse was that those pauses could be pretty expensive. So on average, the the sum of those two pauses was about 10 milliseconds. But even when it was only 10 milliseconds, that was actually pretty good. I mean, we've done a lot of performance work over the years, and I've seen these kind of pauses last for 100, 200 milliseconds in some applications. And during that time, nothing happens, which means no matter how good your UI is, it will jank. Like if the user is trying to scroll, it's not going to work well. So one of the things that uh, Art does is it removes one of the pauses. So now the first the, the first step, the marking the root set, finding the roots of all the allocations that are reachable in your heap, is now a concurrent phase. It doesn't pause the application anymore. And on top of that, the second one, uh, the, well, the only pause that we still have left, is also a lot faster. So instead of spending 10 milliseconds in there, we only spend about 3 milliseconds now. So at most, your application will probably pause for 3 milliseconds. So if your application is well optimized, even if the GC happens during an animation or scrolling, you, sh you should be able to like, uh, reach 60 FPS without any jank. Another thing that uh, was introduced in art was the concept of the minor garbage collection. So the idea here is to keep track of all the objects that have been allocated since the last major garbage collection. Uh, those are typically temporary objects, and we're going to look at them first. So if we can reclaim enough memory by looking at those objects first, because they're short-lived, we won't have to go through the entire heap. Uh, this, th this is one of the things that has an important consequence for Android development, where we used to tell you never allocate even temporary objects because they tend to be expensive, because they're going to fragment the heap. We have to do the allocation. We have to do the collection. All of a sudden, we made temporary object allocation and collection much faster and easier. It's uh, not free. It's just less expensive. Yes. Uh, we also introduced the large object heap that we talked about, so you have less fragmentation. But the, one of the huge benefits of that is because we don't fragment the heap as much, we don't have to grow the heap as much in all the processes. And uh, of course, we don't have those GC4 alloc pauses. I mean, they still exist. We just don't see them as much because they were very, very common in the Dalvik days. And also, like, there's a faster runtime. You know, that's uh, the ahead of time compilation. And we introduce the JIT back, but this has nothing to do with the garbage collector. Uh, Marshmallow. Uh, I was joking to chat yesterday that uh, it's kind of a boring release because I can never remember what was in Marshmallow. Uh, so here it is. Optimizations <laughs> in art. 
Things got faster. Fine grained details, things got faster. Uh, and in N, again, things got faster. Isn't that nice? Uh, allocation in particular, um, they rewrote everything, all the, all the core stuff in assembly, and that turns out to still help in software. Who knew? Uh, and now we're up to about 10 times faster for allocation costs when you compare it to Dalvik. And now we're in Oreo, uh, where basically they rewrote the whole thing. So we introduced an entirely new collector called the Concurrent Heap Compaction Collector. Um, and this means that now we can actually compact in the foreground, not just when we need to do that GC for alloc compact to find a space, but it's actually running all the time, moving stuff around and optimizing what the heap looks like so that allocations are much faster and easier overall. So defragmentation in the foreground, you're not resizing the heap as often because the heap is always optimized because we're always sort of culling the things out of it as necessary. Um, there's far fewer GC for Alex because we just don't get into that situation anymore. Huge savings for the entire device. Think about it. If you can only defragment the heap when an application is in the background, what about the applications and services that are constantly in the foreground? System service, uh, play services, system UI. Well, we couldn't necessarily defragment those until it got into a really bad situation. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do it in the foreground so that those things were optimized? Well, if we can do it for them, that means we're getting system-wide savings on the, on the pure heap size of all of those applications. Uh, so smaller heaps for all means less memory in the entire system. And what we found was the entire device had about a 30% savings on overall memory requirements. So we can take a look at how compaction works in general. We have these 256K buckets that are assigned per thread, which means, again, huge savings in not having to lock down all the threads to do these allocations and collections. Instead, a thread, if it needs memory, it's just responsible for itself. So a thread says, OK, I need some memory. It's handed one of these buckets. It allocates in there. And then over time, that thing may get defragmented. There's a heuristic that they have about if there's less than 70 or 75% utilization in one of these things, um, then they'll go ahead and collect it and empty the thing out entirely. So we see the T1, 2, and 3 regions here don't have much going on there. So we're going to take the memory in there, all of those allocations, and shove them somewhere else in the heap, completely empty out those buckets. Um, which allows something that's super efficient called thread local bump allocator. This means that all we have to do is actually just move a pointer. We don't need to walk the heap to find where the free space is. We just put the next object in the next available space, and we know where that is according to the pointer. Uh, turns out all of this stuff put together, we're now 18 times faster than Dalvik um, for these allocations. So we can see how these allocations uh, work in practice. You can see all these little colored objects. We're making space for them in the different threads that need those allocations. If we take a close look at T1. You've got the free pointer. We've emptied it out. We've zeroed it out. We're at the beginning of that bucket. And now we need to allocate an object. Well, we know where to put it because the pointer tells us. And now all we do is advance the pointer. The pointer tells us where to put the next one and the one after that and so on. So very fast and easy compared to what we were doing before. You can see on the graph the comparison of where we were at with Dalvik allocation cost compared to where we're at, where we're at now uh, in O with bump pointer and assembly uh, allocations instead. All right, so where are we going now? It is important to note that the young generation stuff that we talked about as being so awesome is currently gone. But <laughs> it's back in OSP. And Yay. so it will probably be in a future release. Yep. So it, it's important to note, like, th there are trade-offs here. Like, we believe it's better overall. All of the benefits that you get from the garbage collector in O should compensate for the young generation collections not being there anymore. However, they're still a nice thing to have. So they're back in AOSP. <coughs> so look for those to show up in a future release. So object pools, this is a, a technique that you know, we've recommended using in the past. We use it ourselves uh, extensively inside the platform. And the conventional wisdom is that reusing object has to be faster than allocating them and collecting them all the time. And you can see here we have a, a performance graph. So the x-axis is the size of the object that you're creating or reusing. Uh, in red, it's the time it takes uh, to handle those objects with a pool. And in blue, it's the time it takes to just allocate and collect those objects. And until uh, n, using a pool was basically always a win uh, compared to the garbage collector. 
But with O, with all the improvements we've done, and this new thread bump local, uh, thread bump local allocator, synchronized pools of objects are generally slower. And I want to emphasize the synchronized part of the pool. If you have a pool of objects that use only on one thread, and that thread only, you're effectively doing the kind of optimization that uh, Art does for you now on O. So you might not see the, the same kind of savings. But in general, on O, if you have a synchronized pool of objects, you'd be probably better off without that pool. And Again, make sure you profile your application before you take it out. And there's a certain memory size, a certain size of object where these, these graphs cross. But this was in a benchmark application that was really hammering it and maximizing the bandwidth. So it, the general advice is you really shouldn't use that, especially the synchronized pool approach, because A, it's error prone and tedious to manage, and B, it is slower in general, because that synchronization access tends to be uh, slower than what we can do you now with the You're using a lock, and the whole point of O is that we don't have a lock anymore for the allocations. So uh, what are the recommendations now? Uh, creating garbage is OK. I wouldn't go out of your way to create garbage. It is still taking time. You are requiring us to take time to allocate objects as well as later collect them. Uh, and you're taking up battery and CPU, and you're causing... But don't do like chat, pick up after yourself. Uh, you should see his desk. It's pretty disgusting. <laughs> I like to be a counterexample. Uh, so in general, creating the stuff, if you need it, is OK, and so is collecting it. Use the types and the objects that you need. If they make sense for the architecture, for the APIs that you're building, for the libraries, for your code, uh, go ahead and use those. We are not pushing everybody to use int and bit flags everywhere to optimize every little CPU cycle and memory allocation. Uh, instead, go ahead and allocate when you need to for your use case. However, GC is still overhead. And we're going to look at the demo that showcases that. Um, and make the right choices for you. And in general, the framework programmers, we still are your inner loop. So we still take the old practices, because why would we allocate if we didn't need to, if we can make your inner loop faster? Um, so be aware of the inner loop situations. Otherwise, do the right thing for your code. All right. So uh, wrote a simple application to, to sort of showcase some of the jank stuff that you can see because of allocations and collections. In this. During the on draw, I would call out to a method to run some stuff. And, and in this case, we're going to test auto boxing. So we have an array of 100,000 float objects, capital F float objects. So it's not just the primitive float. Instead, it's the capital F. So we're going to be allocating these objects on the fly. Here's what the, the method looks like that's going to run on every single frame. It's going to walk the entire length of the array and take a primitive float and stuff it into the array, which is going to cause an auto box. So these little tiny allocations are going to go into this array. Um, a lot of them over time, uh, because of the auto boxing thing, it's going to cause a bunch of allocations, and then we're going to need to collect them over time as well. So uh, if we take a look at the demo, how do we pop out? All right. So we're running on K here. We run this animation. Uh, we should take a look at the log here. And we run the auto box. So now we're calling out to that method. And the important thing here, if you look at the log, uh, so we're taking allocation times of 28, 24, sort of in general kind of high 20s milliseconds, and we're causing a lot of GC for Alex because that is what happens uh, when you do this thing. So we can pause this one. We can pop over and see what this looks like on O. We can run the animation here. Let me enable the log for O. We'll do the auto boxing. And now we can zoom in on this, and you will notice a couple of things. One is that the allocation times, obviously, are much uh, less than they were before. And also, more importantly, there are no GC for Alex. We allocate, we collect, but we're never triggering that, that jank-inducing GC for Alex in this case. Uh, there is a similar test that I wrote for bitmaps. Um, so we're running along. Let's take a look at the Kit Kat log. Uh, so in this one, you're allocating bitmaps. Um, and again, we're getting a lot of jank there. If we zoom in on the log, you're seeing the allocations for these large objects at the 1,000 by 1,000 bitmap. You're taking 12, 13 milliseconds each time. And you're constantly triggering these GC for Alex because you need to collect the old memory to make room for the new one. So we pop over to the O log. Let's stop this one. Go over here, run the animation, do the bitmap test. And now we've got allocation times of eh, 0, 1, 
Because again, all it's doing is a malware. It's just shoving it into the large object heap. Very easy to allocate, very easy to collect when it needs it. Stop that. All right. Uh, that just duplicates what I just said. Here's the bitmap test. Very simple. It's just walking through every frame. It's allocating a 1,000 by 1,000 bitmap. And then you see the results that we did. All right, so this is uh, a demo to basically stress test the garbage collector and see what kind of overhead we get. So this is a kind of a ray tracer using fancy physically based rendering that I wrote for, for my desktop. You can tell uh, it's a ray tracer because it's a checkerboard with spheres. That's right. Um, and I ported it to Android. Um, and I won't run you through the code because there's hundreds of lines of, of code. So this is Kotlin. But the trick here is that this does a lot of allocation. So I have a data class, a float three, just contains three floats, uh, x, y, and z. And those are primitives. They're not the, the, the capital F objects that you get in Java. And here I have a function, just an excerpt of those hundreds of lines of code. And you can see it's just doing math on the objects. So I'm using operator overloading in Kotlin. We are multiplying uh, a float three called x by a bunch of constants. We're doing divisions, additions. But the important thing here is that the way those functions are implemented, my, my float three is immutable. So every time I add or multiply, I'm creating a new float three object. So those are fairly small objects, but for every pixel that we'll want to render in that ray tracer, we're going to be allocating hundreds of thousands or millions of those float threes. So we're going to really exercise the GC. So then I created uh, uh, two system images, uh, one on KitKat, one on O, both running on the emulator. We're emulating the same hardware. It's a Nexus 5X. We have the same number of cores. They're running on the same host machine. So the only difference really is the garbage collector. Um, when I'm going to press next, uh, both demos will run at the same time. We're going to start rendering an animation with that ray tracer. And at the top, you have O. And at the bottom, you have KitKat. Uh, see if you can spot the difference in performance. So it will save us some time. It takes 47 seconds uh, for KitKat to render the first tile. Yeah, but it's a really good tile. <laughs> it's a really good tile. <laughs> and again, the only difference, we're running the exact same application. The only difference is effectively the garbage collector. So uh, on O, rendering one tile takes about 100 to 500 milliseconds. And on K, it takes 40 to 50 seconds. So we're two orders of magnitude slower. And if we look at the logs for on KitKat, this is what we see. We see a bunch of GC4 logs. And I just you know, grabbed logs for about 10 seconds worth of computations. And you can see we're constantly stopping all the threads. We're blocking the applications all the time. Nothing is getting done. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of GCs. And you can see every time the GC takes three to five milliseconds. So if we look at SysTrace on O, we can see that even though things are better, they are not quite perfect. Uh, so this is SysTrace. Here uh, you can see what the CPUs are doing. And from afar, it looks like they are very busy because they have uh, three worker threads that are computing those, uh, this 3D scene. But you can see there's a lot of uh, cases where the CPUs are actually not doing anything. There's holes in, in our pipe. So if we look at the app itself, we see two interesting things. First of all, I have my three threads that are computing, that are doing the work. Uh, they are busy chugging along. But from time to time, here, for instance, they pause. And you probably can't read this, but it says full suspend check. And then we're not doing anything. We're not doing any computation. And the reason is we have this thread called the heap task daemon. It's basically the concurrent garbage collector. So even though we're doing concurrent garbage collection, I'm allocating so many objects. It takes so much time for the, the concurrent garbage collection to do its job. So here it's taking about 200 milliseconds in wall time that our threads, so from time to time, have to block anyway. It's not that we want to pause them because we have to pause them. Uh, it's not for the algorithm. It's because the garbage collector is still busy. Um, and originally, I was spawning more threads. And I was running into a, a weird situations where I had so many threads doing computation that I was starving the GC thread. And it could, run, could not run fast enough, so my threads were pausing even more. And as a result, we're getting only about 30 uh, to 40 percent CPU utilization. So we're not using all the compute power that we have available on the device. So that demo you saw running on O could actually be something like three times faster than that if, uh, if I was not allocating as much. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, we only have four minutes left, so we'll go through this fairly quickly, is that you have to be careful when you, do, when you create benchmarks, uh, because the garbage collector can greatly affect 
the results of your benchmark once, well, not really the benchmark itself, but the algorithm you're benchmarking once it's inside your application might behave very differently. Uh, so I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, basically, a quick recap. When you have a CPU, this is the Pixel 3 CPU, uh, the gold cores. We have big cores and little cores. I'm looking at the big cores. Every core has an L1 cache. That's about 64 kilobytes. Every core has an L2 cache, so a 256 kilobyte uh, cache. And then there's an L3 cache that's shared by all the cores. And this is important because when you want to access data, so here we have a float array, and I just want to read one float from that array. The first time we access that float, the CPU is going to go look in the L1 cache, see if it's there. If it's not, it has to go fetch it from the L2. If it's not there, it has to go to the L3 and then finally to the RAM. And every time we have to fall back to a higher level cache, we have to do an expensive memory access that gets more and more expensive as you go up the chain. So accessing the L1 takes only a few nanoseconds. Accessing the L2 is going to take four or five times that amount. Accessing the L3 is going to be probably 10 times slower, and so on. So in a, I wrote a demo that allocates a list of arrays of floats. Uh, each array of floats is about four, it's four floats, so it's uh, 16 bytes. They're represented by the red lines here. And uh, I, I built a benchmark basically using that. I'm just going to run some computations over those, those arrays of floats. So if I allocate all those arrays of floats one after the other in a loop, this is what it's going to look like in RAM. All the arrays are neatly stacked together next to one another in RAM. Um, and I'm uh, using a width of 64 bytes here for a reason that we're going to see in a minute. Then I wrote a very simple you know, algorithm. So I go through the arrays. I take four of them. I run some computations. It doesn't really matter what computations I'm running. And let's see what happens to memory. So when we access the first float array in our list, it's not anywhere in, in our caches. It's in RAM, but it's not in the L1 or the L2 or the L3. So we're going to go fetch it and put it in the L1. But one optimization that CPUs have is that when you need one byte of memory, they're not going to fetch only one byte. They're going to fetch 64 bytes at a time. So by fetching the first array, we actually fetch the next three arrays at the same time. So then when I want to read those arrays, nothing happens because they're already in the L1 cache. So this is pretty efficient. Then we run our computation. Now, in my test app, I've modified the, uh, the initialization of the arrays so that I allocate other stuff between each array. And I'm doing this to basically replicate what happens when your garbage collector moves things around or you have fragmentation in the app if you do your allocations over the lifetime of the application. For any number of reasons that we've seen before, your allocations won't be neatly next to one another in RAM. So here I'm representing this with a bunch of gray, uh, gray lines. So if we run the algorithm again, we go fetch our first array. But instead of fetching the other data that we want, we fetch that great data, stuff that we don't even know what it is, but it's going to be put in the L1. So then when we want the next array, it's not in the L1, and we have to go back to memory and get it, and so on, and so on. But again, we're running the same algorithm. It's just now we have to do more. The CPU has to do more work. And we can recreate the same, uh, the same thing by spacing out our arrays even more so that we won't find the arrays in the L2 or the L3, and we can force the CPU to do even more and more work. So if we run those different variants of the algorithm, uh, where again, all we did was change the way we allocate the objects, we're running the exact same computations, when everything is neatly stored together in RAM, uh, I, you know, the algorithm takes about, I think, 150 milliseconds on a Pixel 3. So that's the no thrash. And when I space out the allocation so that we can't find the data we want in the L1, suddenly we're almost twice as slow. We're running the same exact computations, but we're, the CPU is just busy going you know, to fetch data in RAM. And if I space out the allocations even more so that we can't find the data in the L2, now we are over five times slower. Again, same exact algorithm. So if you write benchmarks, and that's very good, you, sh you should probably do that, be very careful, uh, be aware of the fact that the numbers you're going to get in your benchmark might be very different than the numbers you're going to get in the actual app running uh, uh, you know, on your user's devices. Uh, yeah, you're actually benchmarking the, 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 CPU, access pattern, the CPU access patterns. So and with that, we're done. We have six seconds left. A uh, very important thing, if you are interested in what we talked about today, there's a deeper version of this as well as a lot of the runtime improvements in art over time by leads and engineers on the ART team. So please check that out. It's at the same time as the Fireside Chat, which I think is at 11.10. Um, so please go see that talk as well. And that's it. Thank Thanks. you.
everyone. The next session will begin in 10 minutes.
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Siam Sinner, and I work on Android Text. And today, I would like to uh, talk about why improving your text measurement performance uh, is important for your overall app's performance. Uh, in order to do this, I wanted to gather some numbers. And therefore, I wrote a simple sample app uh, that has a feed. And it's very similar to the applications that we use every day. Uh, it has a list of items. And each item has an image and some text into it. Uh, when we look at the text, uh, as you can see in the picture, the username and the title uh, for each uh, feed item is what we call single style text. And the content uh, contains a text that has different colors, text sizes, fonts, and etc. Uh, one important point here that I would like to emphasize on our platform right now, uh, the hyphenation is turned on by default. However, uh, in this app, as you can see, there is no hyphenation applied. And the reason is Android works uh, by some dictionaries in order to be able to hyphenate the words. And since these words are just random characters side by side, uh, it cannot do any hyphenation. Uh, when we look at each feed item, we see that it has a very uh, simple structure, a linear layout at top, uh, an image view, a relative layout, and three text views for username, title, and content. And I'm pretty sure it's either the same or very similar to one of your app's uh, existing uh, design or layout structure. What I wanted to see was, for each feed item, uh, what is the percentage of the time spent on text versus the whole layout? Therefore, what I did is I wrote a benchmark where I called the linear layout measure. Uh, on one end. And meanwhile, I recorded all the parameters that were passed to those different text views. And I simulated the same with, uh, thing on those uh, text views. Because of the relative layout here, the two text views at the top were getting two measured uh, calls each. Uh, in order to uh, have consistent numbers uh, or repeatable measurements, uh, I locked the CPU. I, ahead of time, compiled my bench benchmark app, and I set the debuggable false. And these numbers that uh, we will see soon uh, are for a pixel x large uh, that is running Android P. So the first question is, how much time does it require for linear layout to measure versus how much time it requires uh, to measure all those three text views? This number was interesting. Uh, for 0.16 milliseconds for the whole layout, and 98% of that time is spent on text. Since the CPU is locked, uh, maybe normally the numbers on a real device would be lower than 4, but still the ratio will remain the same. The next thing I wondered was if I were to disable hyphenation, uh, how much improvement would I get from uh, in the my, uh, linear layout, the full layout? And just turning the hyphenation off drops uh, all the times by like 100%. So it improves the measurement performance by 2x. At this point, I want to remind you that hyphenation was turned on, but there was no visible hyphenation. So turning off hyphenation did not have any effect on the UI. Finally, I wanted to check uh, how the numbers would improve if I were to use a new API that we added on Android P and also Android X, pre-computed text. These numbers were crazier. 4 milliseconds become 0.2 milliseconds. It's almost 20% uh, 20x improvement. Uh, I would like to describe what pre-computed text does and how it works. But before that, uh, I would like to uh, talk about what kind of things we went through while implementing the pre-computed text. We were asking ourselves questions like, why is text measurement so expensive? And can we make it faster? Uh, since almost the beginning, we have been improving the te text performance. But as you would understand from the number 98, it's always going to be a bottleneck. Therefore, we tried to see can we move all this like, expensive measurement to a background thread and provide an API? 
In terms of why it is so expensive, uh, whenever you call, whenever the system calls on measure on text view, uh, it first does some preliminary work and tries to identify the intrinsic width and height of the text that it contains. Then, according to the parameters that are passed to on measure, and also the numbers that it finds, it creates a layout. All these processes goes into our native code, because we have to use some open source libraries such as FreeType and Harpbus in order to uh, measure our text. And when we look from the scope of our measure, 90%, actually more than 90% of our time is spent on the native code. And when we pass a string like this to our native code, what it does is it first divides it into words, and then for each word, it applies text shaping. It finds the font that it can render the character and tries to bring those characters in the word together. When we check how much time this takes compared to all the time that's spent on the native code, it is again more than 90%. So uh, text measurement taking the 90% of the whole measurement, native code taking the 90% of the text, and shaping taking more than 90% of the native code means that most of the measurement time at least for this app, is spent on text shaping. The system applies the same rules for all of the uh, words, and for each word that is measured, it caches them. One of the reasons to cache them is that just after a measure or layout, there will be a draw operation, and the draw will need the same information. Then it applies uh, line breaking and hyphenation. So one valid question here is, why does hyphenation, uh, like turning it off, improves the performance twice? It's mainly because of whenever it tries to hyphenate, it has to apply text shaping uh, for more words. Let's say in here, example is divided into EX and ample. It has to uh, calculate two more, it, it has to do two more shaping on two more words. Uh, so the next question is, if we were to move this uh, expensive measurement to background thread, what we would need? Uh, the first issue we encountered was, before Android P, the native code was getting, uh, acquiring giant synchronization logs. And we fixed it on Android P. We made the logs smaller. Then we wondered, can we use the existing layout classes uh, for such a goal? Uh, and there were two issues, two important issues at that point. One of them, layout classes need a width to be provided to them so that they can do their calculations. And that width, you would not, you would not have that width before measuring, so it was a chicken egg, uh, egg problem. The other one is the layout objects are just blueprints for the text that contain kind of a cache on the Java side, and they do not know about the uh, previously calculated native word layout objects. All they know is how many lines there are, where do they start and end, and what are their coordinates. So we wondered, what if we created a construct? First of all, that doesn't need the width. Second, it should be able to create it on a background thread safely. And third, it has to have strong references to those native word layout objects. This is important because in terms of layout, if you were to create a layout uh, before like, uh, you need it, then maybe when it's time to measure or render it, you will lose the uh, word layout objects. They will be evicted from the cache, and therefore there was no guarantee that you would have the uh, speed improvement. We wanted to extend this construct from car sequence and spannable because we wanted it to be compatible with our current APIs and also your applications. Since it is mostly uh, interested in how the text will look, uh, this construct needed some parameters that would change uh, the text styling, such as the text size, color, local, and etc. cetera. Uh, one important point here is, uh, there was a reason why previously those native objects were being cached and evicted, and it is the amount of memory that they use. Right now, when you use pre-computed text, you will be spending 20 kilobytes for 500 characters. Even though it implements Spanable, which is a mutable interface, every calculation that pre-computed text does 
is done at the construction time. Therefore, you should not be calling uh, set span or remove span functions with spans or styling information that will change how the text will look. Otherwise, you will get an exception because that would invalidate all the computation and it would be useless. When we look at the parameters that pre-computed text requires, uh, since most of the text styling information are ri uh, right now uh, encapsulated in the text pane, it requires a text pane as a mandatory constructor argument. The others are break strategy, hyphenation frequency, and text direction are the functions that you would already know from the static layout builder. Since most of the time you will be uh, designing uh, your text styling in your XML, either layout or uh, styles XML, we want to add a helper function where you can create the pre-computed text parameters using a text view. However, at this point, I would like to emphasize that text view is not required to create a pre-computed text params. It is a helper function. And this function is going to make more sense uh, when we go through how to use pre-computed text with Recycler View. Uh, since version 25, Recycler View has a prefetch feature, and we want to provide ways of using pre-computed text with Recycler View prefetch. And normally, during on your onbind view holder, you will call set text, and then the Recycler View will measure uh, the whole layout that you just uh, created. And we know that the measurement part of the text views are expensive. When you use Recycler View with pre-computed text, you will just change set text to set text feature. And what press fetch will do is, before an item is shown on the screen, it will go to the background thread, do the text measurement, and as a result, will create the pre-computed text. When the computation is ready, it will switch back to the UI thread, and it will call set text with this pre-computed text, which will make the measurement part much faster than the previous uh, case. Using it is pretty easy. Uh, instead of calling set text in your on-bind view holder, you just change it to be set text feature and some configuration for pre-computed text. And here, what you tell the system is, Please run this task on a background thread uh, and pre-compute my text with this car sequence, which is my data, and this display configuration. As you can see here, text matrix param compat becomes very handy to be able to create the pre-computed text params. Uh, one point here is, though, if you are changing your text styling according to the data you have, you have to apply all the styling on your text view or spanables before calling this function. I will continue with how to turn off hyphenation in your app globally so that you can only enable it when you need it. This thing is also pretty simple, and you already saw the effect. It improves the measurement performance by 2x. What you do is, first you define a new style in your styles XML and turn off hyphenation for that style. You extend this style from a base style in order to handle pre-lollipop and after lollipop cases. And for uh, version 21 and above, you extend this base, base text view style from material text view. And finally, on your team, uh, you set Android text view style to be your new style. If I were to summarize, all the talk, I would say, first, go and turn off hyphenation in your app globally so that your measurement can be faster. And it's not going, only going to be the text measurement. The whole screen measurement, depending on how much text you have, will be almost twice faster. And then, please check the pre-computed text API. And if you are using pre-computed uh, recycler view, please apply the pre-computed text and recycler view prefetch uh, code that I showed you so that you will get uh, a more smooth scrolling experience for your users. This was my talk. Thank you very much for listening.
Hey everyone, my name is Jeff Sharkey, and I'm a software engineer on the Android Framework team. And today, we're going to be digging into files on Android and all the various places that Android gives you to store those files. So today, we'll dig into starting by looking at some common locations that Android offers. The first broad category is internal storage. Uh, and these, this storage can be classified as safe and secure because it's something the Android OS protects. It's part of the application sandbox model that we offer. You've probably encountered some of these directories before, like context get files dir. It's a great default location to store things. One that's slightly different is get cached dir. We'll dig into that a little bit later today. Um, but one thing to note is that files that you store in that location, the disk space is not counted against your application. And the reason for that is that Android reserves the right to go in there and delete some of those files if the user needs that disk space elsewhere. So it's a trade off, it's a two way street. Another directory, get no backup files dir. This can be useful uh, if you have things like cloud messaging tokens that you want to renew when your app migrates between devices. Um, so it's a great, uh, if the device goes through a backup and a restore phase, those files that you store in that directory, they won't be carried across the backup. So it can be useful for that. Finally, get code cache directory. This is a great place to store things like jitted code or optimized code. And the OS will do two things. Uh, it will delete contents inside of the directory under two conditions. Either when your application is updated via Play Store, or whenever the OS itself receives an upgrade, say from the O release to the P release, it will clear the contents of that directory. So that's a summary of internal storage. Next, the other broad category of locations is external storage. And when we think of external storage, it's more of a shared area, and it's unprotected. And the reason I just mentioned that is data that you store in that location, you may write it there, uh, but other applications can request the storage permission on Android. And they may write that data or modify it without you knowing about it. And so it's something uh, we definitely discourage storing sensitive contents in that location. Um, if you do need to store data out there, consider finding a way to prove, uh, to verify the integrity of that data if you need to trust, if you need to trust it. The directories here, files are similar to internal storage cache dir the same way. Um, external media dirs, data that you save in there will be scanned by media store on the device. So it's a good place to store photos or videos that you want to be included in the user's uh, gallery application to be scanned and included there. Get OBB dirs. Uh, OBB stands for opaque, opaque binary blobs. And these are, uh, these are large files typically used for game developers that are delivered through Google Play. Data that you store in those locations, they're counted towards your app's code size instead of its data size. So, so far, we've talked about broadly internal storage and external storage. And these are all great places for you to store data that belongs to your app. Um, but you might find yourself creating data that belongs to the user that the user may want to store in a different location. And that's a great place to use the storage access framework. Um, and there's two intents that were great there, intent action open document and create document. These have been around in the platform since the KitKat release. And you can think of them as an open and a save dialog box for the user. It really offers a great experience because the user has control over exactly where those files are stored on the device. It gives them the freedom to choose any of those locations. It also opens the door for cloud storage providers. You don't have to integrate a cloud provider SDK into your application. Uh, you just simply launch the intent, and the user can select uh, where they want that file to be stored. There's some great talks that have dug into this uh, elsewhere, so I'd encourage you to search around uh, online. There's some great content that digs more in depth. So we talked about some basic locations. Let's do a deep dive on two specific advanced locations today. Uh, one that we'll dig into is direct boot, and the second we'll dig into is cache data. So first, direct boot, which you may not have encountered before. Um, and first, it's worth starting out like uh, we, built, uh, we built the direct boot feature in the Android N release to solve an important problem. Uh, when, before the N release, when we encrypted an Android device, uh, and if the user rebooted that device, no apps could run until after the user had entered their credentials, a pin, pattern, or password. So what we did in the end release is we created two storage areas that they're still encrypted, but they're encrypted with two different keys. And we call these areas the device protected area and the credential protected area. Uh, the device protected area uh, becomes available by virtue of the device proving that it hasn't been tampered with. So when the device boots up, uh, there is D DM Verity verifies uh, that the device hasn't been tampered with. By virtue of proving that, it unlocks that, that device protected storage. 
then later, when the user enters that PIN pattern or password, the credential protected storage becomes available uh, for applications to use. If you haven't encountered these APIs before, rest assured that all of your data by default as an app developer is always stored in credential protected area. But if you, if you find a place where you'd like to run before the user has unlocked their device, that's where it might be useful to store small bits of information out in that, out in that device protected area so that your app uh, can be useful while the device is locked. So then you might ask the question, how do you gain access to that storage area? Um, the credential protected area, as I mentioned, context.getfilesdir offers that credential protected area. Um, there's a method on context, and you can see it down here at the bottom of the screen. Create device protected storage context. It's a little bit of a mouthful. What it does is it returns another different context where the file APIs uh, referring to internal storage on that returned context point at the device protected storage. Uh, so let's take a look at some code examples of how you might integrate with those APIs. One of the first things you'll need to do is if you want to become device uh, direct boot aware is to think about what data you want to keep on credential protected storage or migrate out to device protected storage. So a lot of you will be writing code like this to decide during that initial upgrade step how you want to migrate data back and forth. The first thing you'll probably do when starting your application is ask, is the user currently unlocked? Has that pin pattern or password been offered? So the user manager class offers, you can check, is the current user unlocked? Assuming that they are unlocked, that means you have access to both the device and credential storage. And here we can see there's two move methods that are offered as helpers. You can move shared preferences between two locations, and you can also move databases back and forth. The reason, the reason we provide these helper methods is oftentimes shared preferences or databases can actually uh, be made up of multiple files on disk, and some of that data may also be cached in memory. So by calling these helper methods to move that da data around, we ensure that all the data gets moved and that any, any in-memory caches aren't validated along the way. When you think about data that you would want to migrate, uh, one thing we say is only move the data you think you need to provide that user experience while the device is locked. So things like if you're building an alarm clock app, you'd probably move the user's next alarm time out into that device protected area to make sure the alarm clock would go off if the user, uh, user's device is currently locked. Another strategy that we've seen used, uh, if you have auth tokens to talk to a server, we've actually recommended people create a second type of auth token for your cloud server. Uh, one auth token is a full, rich, full access token, which you probably use today. We'd recommend keeping that in the credential protected area and creating a second, much more limited in scope auth token and only storing that limited in scope auth token out in the device protected area. Maybe that auth token, when it talks to your server backend, is only able to return the fact that the user has three unread messages. And maybe it can't do any operations beyond that. Um, so it offers, it helps you deliver the experience of getting the user's attention when you need to, but without, uh, without uh, being able to access any of the additional richer information uh, in your cloud. OK, so we've talked. If it's unlocked, we can migrate data back and forth. The else clause here, uh, we'd recommend that you register. There's a runtime broadcast that's sent, an action user unlocked. And that would allow you to then run code when, you're actually, when the user un enters that pin pattern or password. The middle code snippet here, uh, those move methods, they work both directions. So if you accidentally move, direct, move some data out into the device protected area, you can also move it right back into the credential area. And another tidbit, another API that might be useful at the bottom of the screen there, um, if you're ever wondering if a particular file is going to be encrypted at rest by the operating system, you can quickly check for that as well. There's a storage manager uh, is encrypted API. And that can be useful if you're trying to decide if you want to roll your own encryption uh, or rely on the encryption at rest that the OS provides. All right, so a second deep dive area that we'll dig into is cached data on the OS. And this is typically data that you can regenerate or re-download um, later on if it happens to be deleted. And I mentioned earlier that this is a two-way street. Um, the OS won't count the data that you use in that area against your app. But at the same time, we reserve the right to go in there and delete some of that data if the user needs the disk space for something else that they're doing. Um, and something that we improved in the O release is we rewrote the algorithms used internally. Um, one of the biggest questions we got from you, from developers, was how much cache space is appropriate to use? Um, is, can I use 500 meg? Is that too much? Is 50 meg too much? Um, so now we offer explicit guidance. There's an API on Storage Manager to figure out a cache quota for your application, a reasonable amount that the, thing, that the device thinks is reasonable for your app to use. 
And the nice thing is the OS adjusts that value over time. So if the user spends a lot of time in your application, we're going to increase that number to give you more cache space to work with so that you can offer a better user experience to, the, to your users. Um, another thing that we did in the O release, we rewrote the internal implementation of how that data is cleared. Before the O release, uh, we would literally list all of the cache files on the OS, sort them by modified time, and delete the oldest files. And you can imagine that there were ways you could gamify that system by setting your modified time out to like the year 2038. Um, so we fixed that. And so now in O and future releases, uh, the OS will delete data from apps that are most over their quota first. So what this means, if your app stays right around the cache quota that the OS has recommended, you can be pretty confident that your data will be there and will remain available um, even as the user uh, starts filling up their disk. So what are these? Let's look again at some code snippets, like how would we use this in practice? So again, going to Storage Manager. If you're integrating with a common class, say like disk LRU cache, it's pretty easy to connect the two things together. You can ask the OS for that recommended uh, cache quota bytes and plug it straight into the disk LRU cache to help it trim how much size it's using. If you have multiple types of caches, it's up to you to decide how you want to fractionally account or distribute that cache amongst your, the inside of internals of your app. The second code snippet there, uh, if you're rolling some of your own caching, uh, point out there's a method called get cache size bytes. This is a fast way to ask the question how much cache space your app is currently using. Uh, and that's an optimized call that will turn very quickly. Um, and it's faster than you having to go iterate over your own disk usage to try to figure out how much space you're using. Another feature that we added in the O release, which is covered at the bottom half of this slide, is the ability to have cache behaviors. And we heard this from developers that it, it can be useful. You'll, you may download multiple files that really should be treated as a unit or a group. Uh, one concrete example is downloading, say, a movie file and a subtitles file that goes along with it. If you store both of those in the cache directory, if one of them gets deleted, the other file isn't really useful and valuable. So the cache behavior offers you a way to indicate, to tell us as the operating system, that if we need disk space, we should delete both of those things at the same time. All right, so we talked about some of the common storage locations. Let's switch gears and talk about how we can work together, both the OS um, helping you as developers. And one of the biggest things that we offered in the O release um, is the ability to help you get the disk space that you need. Before the O release, if you wanted to do a large download, let's say one gigabyte in size, and if you looked just at the free disk space, you may only see 500 megabytes were free, and it may look like that download was impossible. But there's a new API in the O release where the OS will offer to go and delete cache files belonging to other applications to help free up the disk space for that operation to succeed for your application. If there still isn't enough disk space, there's new intents that you can launch to help get the user involved, to help them pick items uh, and different things that they can do uh, to help free up that disk space. So how do we use this API? Here's a snapshot of this. The very top of this slide, this is maybe the way that you've been writing code today. Um, you'll just do a pretty simple check. You have a download size. You're comparing it against java.io.file.getUsable space. How much disk space is there? That's the operation that may look like it wouldn't be possible to succeed. But if you convert your code to using the rest of the code snippet on this slide, if you call the storage manager .get allocatable bytes API, that will return not just the free space, it will also include space that the OS is willing to go free up on your behalf from other applications uh, cache data. So in this case, it may look like if we have enough space uh, inside of that if block, we can actually open that file output stream. And now there's an API called allocate bytes. And what this will do is it will go actually claim that disk space for your application. Deep underneath, it'll use the f allocate system call to ensure that those blocks belong to your application and that you do have the space that's guaranteed to belong to you. So that could be a useful, uh, useful API to use. And the else block here, if there still wasn't enough space, we now offer some great intents for you to ask the user for help uh, to come along and free up information, free up the disk space. Sharing content. We've covered this a little bit before. How can we work together there? Please always use content URIs when you're sharing between applications. Never use file URIs. And the reason is that receiving application, they may not have the permissions that they need to directly access the files on disk. If you use content URIs, the OS can manage the dynamic permissions to give uh, the receiving app to make sure that they can open the content. If you find yourself in this position, file provider in the support library is a great way to convert between the two uh, with a single line of code, every place to, to convert from file to content. 
And over the years, because this is an important, uh, important thing to pay attention to, we built strict mode APIs to help you track down and detect these places in your app. You can detect places where you might be accidentally sharing file URIs. And now, uh, in a more recent release, you can also detect places where you're sharing a content URI, and you might be forgetting the flag grant read or the flag grant write to go along with that intent. So those can be two APIs that are helpful to, to look at. Native code is another area to think about. Uh, we'd strongly recommend that you look at opening files uh, up in higher level managed code, up in Java or Kotlin, and passing down the already open file descriptor, the integer, down into native code. And the reason for that is opening it in managed code gives the OS the opportunity to notice uh, and inspect and correct things. Uh, in particular, it can look for strict mode violations. Um, if you open a managed code, it may notice that the thread that you're currently running on is important to the user, uh, is, may block or cause a jank in your app. Um, and we're going to start using this more in future Android releases. So this is why we want to strongly encourage, open the file in Java or the higher level language, pass the integer down to native code. Um, don't pass the file path itself across the JNI boundary. And a quick code snippet of what that looks like. You can pretty quickly do this with parcel file descriptor. You can open a particular file on disk, maybe for read write in this case. And there's a method called detach fd that will return that integer. It's just an int that is ready for you to pass across a JNI boundary uh, as a jint. So that's the recommended design uh, going forward. Another note that might be a, a trick or a tip that could be useful, if you find yourself just jumping across JNI to do a handful of system calls, you might go look at android.system.os. There are several dozen POSIX syscalls ready for you to use up in Java today. We only added that a couple of releases ago. So you may be able to find that you can do those handful of syscalls purely in Java, and you may be able to get rid of the JNI and the native code in your application. So take a look at that. And finally, working with media. Um, we'd really recommend that you use Media Store if you're looking to find the photos or videos that the user has on their device. And there, you might be tempted to go and build your own index uh, of whatever media you find, but that can be pretty wasteful, both of CPU and battery for the user. Um, and another note is we're actively working on improving Media Store and really uh, adding functionality there. So stay tuned over the next couple releases. Um, another note is open files, open the, the content of that media through Content Resolver. You may have noticed that there are columns across the operating system called underscore data, and they return a, a raw file system path. Um, over time, you may have noticed that a handful of those underscore data columns have been deprecated in previous releases. And it's just to expect that's going to continue. Uh, so you'll notice more of those underscore data columns becoming deprecated over time. We really want to encourage people to move towards content URIs as a best practice. So yeah, that's, thank you for your time uh, being able to dig into some of the uh, nitty gritty areas of storage. And I'll be available in the Q&A section uh, afterwards if you have questions for me. Thanks for your time.
everyone. The next session will begin in 10 minutes.
Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Nicholas from the Android Platform team. Well, thanks for being here. I'm impressed you're, uh, there are people showing up. The Android Fireside chat was uh, kind of scaring me that uh, everyone would just avoid this session. Um, but uh, no, it's great to have you here. Uh, and uh, this talk is about art. Now, there's been a change of schedule this morning. Uh, you may have attended the chat talk. Show of hands, who went to the chat talk? OK. How was it? Was it good? good. Yeah? Great. Were you excited? Yeah. 18x allocation times? <laughs> um, so there's a, a part of uh, this talk, which was supposed to be on uh, garbage collection, and that my colleague David was uh, planning on, on, on giving. But we're not going to rehash the same thing. So I'll put long pauses, awkward ones, I hope, um, during the talk so I can fit the 40 minutes. Um, so bear with me. Uh, so given we're celebrating 10 years of Android, um, David and I thought it would be a good idea to think about what we've done the last 10 years and how the Android runtime, which is the thing uh, we worked on uh, for a couple of years now, um, evolved. So here we are. So some of you went to the chat talk, so I guess you already know what the what an Android runtime is in the Android stack. Uh, but in case you don't, it's that little layer, that yellow one here, uh, between the Android framework, like the Android operating system, and the actual underlying kernel. Um, the runtime uh, runs both the Android framework and all of the apps. So like everything written in Java, that's what we execute. Um, and so being so core in the platform, it becomes responsible for a ton of things. Uh, like the, the user experience would be very, could be very bad uh, if the Android runtime was not efficient. And you saw that this morning with how the GC was sort of kind of poor in the David days. So in this talk, I'll show you over time how runtime versions um, that, that like the, all the iterations we've made over the past, uh, they've oscillated between, okay, what do we need to improve for this year? Um, and like I said, it, uh, our, the Android runtime is responsible for a bunch of things. Uh, and raw performance is, is one clear one, like how, how fast do we execute Java code. But clearly, it's also responsible for jank, right? Like the 16 milliseconds window, if the runtime is not able to execute the Java code of, that app, of the app, well, then we'll miss the frame and then produce a lot of jank. Application startup, there's a lot of Java code that needs to be executed during application startup. Again, if the runtime is slow, startup will be slow. Boot times, the Android OS is written in Java, so a lot of code, again, executes during boot. Uh, battery, if we're slow, we're going to tank your battery. And uh, install time. Uh, is also something we care about because we are, when we get an APK, the platform will optimize it, and that could take a long time depending on uh, how we implement it. And uh, we don't want that long time to happen because we want you to use the app right away. And the other two, which is like memory uh, related, is like disk space. It's like how much space is the runtime taking for its own optimizations. And then RAM. Um, so Java being Java, there's allocation uh, that the runtime needs to handle. Uh, and if it doesn't do it well, then it can take a lot of RAM. So this, essentially, there's been three incarnations of the Android runtime. The first one was Dalvik. It was the first implementation that shipped with Android. And Dalvik's, Dalvik's purpose, or Dalvik's main focus, was how do we save RAM? And the reason being, back in the days, like 10 years ago, the RAM we had on the phones we were shipping was like even less than 200 megabytes. And that was very little if you want to execute the whole event, the Android stack. So everything Dalvik was doing was about, OK, how do we save on RAM? So it could not generate any code, JIT or IoT. Um, is how we generate code. Um, it could just interpret 
the Dex code, the Dex code being the thing that gets sent to, the, uh, to Android for execution of your app. Eventually, it got a just-in-time compiler so that we could generate native code of the Dex code. But again, it was very limited to what it could do because RAM was the main focus. And its GC was tailored for A apps to not allocate objects. If you've been to the talk this morning, things have changed. But back in the days, the recommendation was like, please avoid allocations. And this worked well for, I think, five years uh, till KitKat. Um, but there was like a point where like, David could not keep up. Phones were getting bigger. Uh, phone, phones were getting uh, more performant, more RAM. Like the 2000, uh, that was 2013, 14. I think it was one gig, two gigs of RAM. Um, and uh, apps were also getting bigger. So initially, apps were supposed to be like this small layer between the uh, UI and the framework, but apps become started doing a lot of more and more things. So that 16 millisecond window I talked for rendering a frame, well, more things started to be executed there. So we had to do something about it. And the answer happened in Lollipop with Art, uh, which introduced ahead of time compilation. So no more interpre interpretation, or very, very, very little. And most of the things were ahead of time compiled, meaning we were executing native code for your app. And that is like, probably 20x faster than interpretation. We also introduced like a state-of-the-art um, GC, what you find in regular runtimes of being precise. That means we're not going to be confused by an integer that looks like, a, like an object. But also generations, so that the GC pauses we need to do uh, in the UI thread will be very short. So pauses don't actually end up uh, cre creating jank. The third incarnation is like an evolution of art. Uh, it happened in two releases, like Android Nougat and Android Oreo. In Android Nougat, we introduced profile-guided compilation. I'll talk about this later, uh, or explain a bit later what it is. Uh, but it, it drastically helped on scaling arts ahead of time technology uh, to, to be more optimized for the, pl for the, for the platform. S the profile guided compilation has underneath the way it works is like it's a hybrid just in time, ahead of time compiler. So we're trying to use the best of both worlds uh, to optimize the platform. And in O, after we've done all of some optimizations in N, in O, we focused on the garbage collector and implemented a brand new one, which makes the pause even shorter uh, on, the, on the UI thread. We call this concurrent GC. Uh, now the, the, all the GC, happening, hap the GC happens on a different thread, so it's not affecting the execution of the app. All right. So before I dive in into our details, I wanted to show this to you, like the state of Android distribution today. And in case you're still optimizing for Dalvik, or if you need to care about Dalvik and this just annoying GC4 alloc, if you've been at Chatstock, you know what I'm talking about. Well, there's still this 10% uh, here, right? 10, 10 KitKat, Jellybean, and a bit of few other. So around 10% of devices are still running KitKat. So my recommendation is like, it still matters. 10% is probably like 200 million users. Um, it's quite a big number. So it still matters. But give it a couple of years, and hopefully in two years, that will be gone, and that will be part of this museum. All right. So things art uh, matters for. I've put eight boxes. Um, they look nice, and we do matter a lot for this. Like, if we do get it wrong, things will go bad on your device. Raw performance, I talked about. Um, that's Java execution. Jank, application startup, battery, 
this space, RAM, boot times, install times, I'm just repeating myself, but this is really important, right? This is the thing that makes your user experience kind of okay so that you can enjoy um, the apps. So I'm going to go over the releases I talked about, what, what uh, mo the different incarnations of the Android runtime, um, to show what it brings to the, so what, what makes art today. Because art uh, has a lot, like I, like I said, has a lot of evolutions. And, but we also, we also took things from Dalvik, like good things from Dalvik. Uh, I'm listing the major ones here because the list would be too long. Um, and obviously the major thing that Dalvik, the Dalvik architecture brought was RAM savings. And for that, Dalvik introduced, or Dalvik or the Android platform actually introduced the Zygote, um, which is the parent process that creates all of the other processes. So because it's the parent process, you have the option of that parent process starting up or allocating a lot of memory for, uh, that apps can use. And then that memory can be shared with the other apps. And that's super important. That means that every app now doesn't need to allocate this memory that it would need otherwise to actually execute uh, the, in, in art. Today, that's around like a, uh, a couple of dozens of megabytes that we save per app and that the Saigo just allocates and share with the, uh, with the other apps. Then Lollipop, that was the major shift when we introduced ahead of time compilation. Uh, ahead of time compilation happens with what we call an SSA compiler, um, static signal assignment compiler. Um, that's a compiler buzzword. Um, that is like state of the art compiler that does a lot of optimizations and makes your code up to 20x faster. So we introduced that ahead of time compiler that helped a lot on reducing jank, because now the code was compiled, not needing to be interpreted and very fast. Reducing application startup, same argument, but also saving battery. Like now the execution being 20x faster, you can Im imagine that, well, it's not the point of saving 20x times on your battery, but things get faster and, and we don't need to execute a lot on the CPU anymore. We also save on boot times. The whole Android OS is ahead of time compiled and doesn't need to be interpreted at boot. So here we go. Things go faster at boot. We also introduced the, uh, a new GC, generational GC, which reduced the pauses and removed the need for GC for alloc in Davik. Then the third incarnation, Nuga and Oreo. I mentioned how there we introduced profile gated compilation, and that thing helps. It's kind of the mother of all the optimizations today that we do. It's like it helps a, a lot of these metrics. It helps on uh, it helps on jank, like less code gets compiled. The things that we care about gets optimized, so the UI thread needs to to uh, run less code. It helps on application startup. Because we can profile the application, we're able to know what matters at startup so that we, when we recompile the app, we recompile it with optimizations that optimize startup. It helps on battery. Again, we're saving on the amount of, of, of things we're interpreting. It helps on disk space because instead of compiling the entire app, which was, which was, was what Lollipop was doing, now we're only compiling the hot parts of an app. That's probably like 10 to 20% of the DEX code. So 80% just doesn't get compiled. And that's a lot of savings. Saves on RAM. Having a concurrent GC means we can do a lot more uh, defragmentation of the heaps of every app. So we save that on the fragmentation that we had in the previous GC. Profile gate compilation also helped a lot on boot times. Remember the optimizing apps dialog? Well, that's the reason we're able to remove it. Now, we didn't need to AOT compile at boot all of the apps to make sure the device was reasonable in performance. We were, we, we were able to just, OK, 
we take an OTA, we're going to JIT all the apps so we don't need to compile at boot. We're going to JIT when the user wants it. And then eventually, we're going to do profile gated compilation of the apps when the user is not using its phone. And then finally, it helps on install times, because instead of waiting for the compiler to compile the entire app when you install, now we didn't compile it at all. We just rely on the JIT the first time the app was being used. And lastly, I wanted to mention Pi, because the, the time we developed Pi was kind of at the same time of Android Go. Uh, and Android Go is a great effort in the Android platform. Uh, and for that, we, the work we did was mostly to save on disk space and RAM, because Android Go is like 512 to a gigabit of memory uh, and 4 or 8 gigs of, of disk space. So most of our efforts were focused on improving RAM and also improving uh, disk space. So in that release, we introduced Compact Dex, which is like a, a compact version of the Dex format, uh, which saves on RAM because the, 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 the less you need to put into the memory of the Dex code, uh, the more you're saving, obviously. Also, when the uh, APK has uncompressed Dex uh, uh, stored, uh, we will not uncompress it on disk. So before we, before we used to uncompress it to do optimizations on the DEX file, which we cannot do in the APK because the APK is signed. So we un we, before Pi, we uncompress it, do some optimizations, and rely on them on the first few iterations before we do profile gated compilation. Now we give the option of, to the uh, developer if the developer wants to save on disk space, then put the DEX file uncompressed in DPK, which means we're not going to uncompress it on device. So we'll have just one version of the DEX code and not a compressed version in DPK and an uncompressed one on disk. All right, that was a lot of optimizations. I wanted to focus on uh, one, which is raw execution performance. Because what you saw this morning was pretty cool with 18x, but this is even cooler. So obviously, the faster Art runs, uh, the more we're saving on battery on application startup and make the UI smooth. So it really matters all the optimizations we do. And over the releases, we've kept on improving the performance by looking at actual applications. In this case, it's the Google Sheets. And every release we worked on, like, OK, how do we improve the Google Sheets app? And the Google Sheets app, or the Google Sheets team, helped us build benchmarks that show like, how long it takes to do uh, sheets manipulation. Here, higher is better. Blue is Dalvik. And that's a score of 1. So we make it relative to Dalvik, the performance. Red is Lollipop. So that's when we introduced Art. And then yellow is today. And you can see that we went from around like a 4x improvement when we moved to Art in Lollipop to like an average of 10x today, and even to 26x on one benchmark. So we're pretty happy with those numbers. But we, we just didn't look just at sheets. Uh, we tried to also look at what, what, happens to, what happened to other apps. So a, a couple of years ago, we also, we also worked with the Chrome team and the YouTube team to look at what they think we should optimize. And there again, like after the fact, even though we were not focused on optimizing those benchmarks, we saw that we had this 4 to 6x improvements um, with what we've done. So there's two, ex two examples. There's the Octan benchmarks. That's the JavaScript benchmark suite that we ported for our purposes. Uh, that's Delta Blue and Richards, and it's again 2 to 4x, uh, 3.5x uh, for those benchmarks, up to 6x uh, to, uh, in Pi. And then ExoPlayer, that's the uh, audio and, and video processor uh, driving the YouTube app on Android. Well, again, around 2x for uh, the introduction of art, and then 4x uh, today in Pi. 
And while I, while I have your attention on performance, I have a shameless call to do. We're always super interested in improving code that you think is important. So if on your side, you'd like us to show off how we improve performance of your app, uh, please come talk to us. There's the office hours from 1 to 6 uh, this afternoon. Uh, and we would be really interested in knowing what you think we should care about for performance. And then we can show that off here. All right. So the question then is, like, how did we get this level of improvements? I mentioned how Art now has a modern compiler implementation. I call that SSA. Um, and thanks to that modern like SSA uh, compilation, there's a bunch of optimizations we're able to do now. If you know compiler, well, you, things could look familiar, inlining, uh, dead code elimination. I'm not going to go over all of them, lucky you. Um, but instead, I'll focus on an example that shows how those optimizations matter, especially for a language like Kotlin that puts a lot more abstractions uh, to help the productiv productivity of the user, but makes it more challenging for the runtime to optimize. All right, so let's take this simple method. Very simple. It takes a function that takes one argument and then returns a the length. When we run that to, through our dexer, R8, or awesome new Dexter. Um, here's the code you, you get. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, even if you're fam not familiar with text code, like you're creating a string, um, then Kotlin having non nullable types, it'll make sure that the string, the string is not null when you get it passed to the function. So it adds this helper method. Hey, check that this parameter is not null. Then invoke virtual of the length method on the argument and return that. Kotlin comes with the built-in library. So that's where you can find implementations of those helper methods. And for that case, it's only like a simple method that will just, OK, is the argument null? Yes. Then I will throw, calling another helper. Or I will just return and return back to the method. So method calls are pretty expensive. So the first thing that Art will do is that it'll try to inline that very small method within the caller. Here, the compiler has inlined it at the place it's being called. Uh, just for simplicity reasons, this looks like Dex code. It's actually the intermediate format of the compiler, but I'm not going to show that to you. Um, so. Compile code is being inlined, which helps on performance. But there's more we can do. Because the compiler sees, oh, wait, that throw parameter is null exception call. It actually always throws. So there's a few things I can do with that information. First one is called code layout where we're trying to put together like the regular flow of the method. So things that rarely happen, we put that at the very end of the method. So it doesn't affect the flow of the execution. Nifty trick, right? We just, return, we just switch the, the comparison from, hey, are you not zero to are you zero? And then we jump to the end of the method, which is like, hey, throw an exception. So the expensive jump is out of the picture now. The second optimization is that we're going to move things that, hey, the regular flow doesn't care about. In this case, let me just go back, if I can. Yeah. In this case, the construction of the string that is being passed to the helper was the first thing you execute in the method. But you only need that if you end up calling the helper. So we move that construction of that string, that string right before the helper, meaning we don't need to execute it anymore. 
So in the end, we started from a method that was like creating a string, calling a helper, then doing its thing, which is returning the length, to a method that just like checks if it's null. If it is, jump to an expressive jump somewhere. If it's not, just continue the flow and, and, and return the length of the method. The length of the string, sorry. All right. So that was raw performance. I have two other things to talk about. Actually, just one, because I have to talk about application startup and garbage collection. But I'm not going to redo the garbage collection side. Chet and Roma did a great job this morning. So with application startup, um, it's, a, it's been a major fo focus since we introduced profile gated compilation. And that happened in Nuga. Profile gated compilation is when, when the app is being installed, we compile it in a very quick way. Like we're not going to generate, um, um, we're not going to do like a full AOT compilation. We're going to do very little optimizations that do not affect install time. So we're optimizing install time. So the app is being installed, then you run it. The app is being executed. Initially, it gets executed with interpretation, and then method gets hot, and then JIT kicks in and compiles those hot methods. The JIT knows what those hot methods are. So we are going to dump to a profile file those hot methods. So that when your device is idle, the user is not using it, it's charging, 100% charge, then we have this, what we call, profile guided daemon that will just like, OK, let me work over all the profiles and recompile the app and compile them, compile only the things that matter based on that profile. And you have like this virtuous loop where the next time you run the app, that's, we're going to use that optimized version of the compile code and then run it with what got AOT'd. Maybe some methods got missed. So we'll interpret them, they'll get hot, we'll JIT them, we'll update the profile, and then again, the daemon kicks in, say, oh, the profile got updated, let me recompile the app. So there's this virtuous loop of like, trying to be better and better uh, over time. And why is that helping an application startup? Well, that's because the, the things we do when we compile the app based on a profile are really optimized towards this. We are only going to comp we're, sorry, we're going to compile startup methods. So now no need to interpret them. Things that get executed at startup will get compiled. We're going to lay out the DEX and the compile code. So things that execute at startup will be next to each other. So now we don't need to jump over the entire DEX file to actually get access to the method. And that's very important. Like I said, Apps got bigger. So if you need to bring up the entire DEX file just for startup, that's a lot of time waiting on I.O. So we're trying to reduce that by putting everything on startup at the beginning and then the rest at the end. Profile gate compilation also generates an application image. Other runtimes will call this a snapshot. It's a representation of Java classes that we put in that image. It's a file. And that avoids us to actually load the classes at runtime again. So there's this, there's this pre-formatted number of classes with a class loader. And when we start up, we just take the class loader, all the classes are already populated, and we're done. We don't need to do ca code, uh, class loading anymore. We're also going to try to pre-initialize classes. So Java has this step of like, oh, classes need to be initialized before they need to be executed. So what we do during profile guided compilation is that we're going to pre-initialize anything we can to avoid that being executed when we start the app. And then finally, I said, we're not going to compile code that doesn't get executed. That helps a lot because then your old file is very small. Your, sorry, your compiled file uh, is very small. 
So there's not a lot you need to bring up in memory to actually execute. What do we gain from all those um, optimizations? Where there can be, we always gain doing those optimizations. But depending on the app, it can be under, under 10% or 30%. And that's usually around how many Java code do you have when you start your app. Typically, camera has a lot of native code. So that's where it's on the low end of like 10% improvement. But in this example, you see docs and maps, which are very Java heavy, go from around 30% of, of app startup improvement. And this is numbers that we got from the maps team, uh, who got that from actual users, so actual data that comes from the field. And when this, the maps team saw that graph, they were like, what is going on? How come at install, things are around like a one second of app startup, to over time, things get faster? How, how does that happen? And every time they update the app, it's the same trend. It starts pretty high and then goes low. And the answer is profile gate compilation. Here you're clearly seeing that over time, things get better. Today, in Pi, what we've talked about at I.O. last year is the introduction of profiles in the cloud. And that's how we're making the entire ecosystem send us profiles, like actual execution profiles of users, so that we can send those profiles to new users of app. So they don't get this starts at one second, ends up at 750 milliseconds. They get the 750 milliseconds right away because they get the profile at the point they install. Garbage collection, like I said, I'm not going over them, over it. Um, maybe I can just put back a number that we're all very proud of. Here we are. Ah, that's the last. Um, so this is resuming what Chet talked about this morning. It's all the technology we've used uh, over time uh, for building a, a GC. Uh, so uh, you see in KitKat, we had this, what we call concurrent mark sweep. Um, there was one part of the, the GC that was concurrent. And that uh, uh, stayed for up until Nougat. In Oreo, that's when we introduced the uh, concurrent collector. Um, allocation in KitKat, it was the main bottleneck, uh, and it was single-threaded, so it needed to lock to actually allocate something. Uh, the intro the intro introduction of a new GC in Lollipop meant that we could allocate within the thread and not need a lock. So that improved performance of allocation. Um, the, uh, the, when you allocate objects that are short-lived, right? And that's the motto of, of, um, of Java. It's like, feel free to allocate objects. The ones that are short-lived will be removed by the GC very quickly. But in KitKat, in Davic days, that was not the case. It was, it, you, had, you pay a very high cost um, by allocating temporary objects. Lollipop is when we introduced a new GC, and the, you didn't pay that cost uh, at all. Like allocating short-lived object was, we had generations, so things were removed pretty quickly. There's an asterisk for Oreo, because when we introduced Concurrent Collector, um, we s remove the generations out of the, of the collector. Um, we're fixing that today. Uh, it, it's in EOSP, the improvement of the GC with generations. So hopefully we'll be there in the device soon. And then fragmentation. Fragmentation is a big problem uh, in Android because if you're not able to allocate memory, your app will be killed. So doing compaction, of the memory so that 
things are not fragmented, is super important. KitKat did a bit, but very little. In Lollipop of a Marshmallow, we were doing it when the app was going background. So eventually, we're reclaiming the memory. But Oreo is when we made it like, it's really important that we compact all the time so that the memory is there available all the time. And then the number I was looking for. Allocation speed, we went from a very low number in Davik to an 18x improvement in Oreo and Pi. And here's, here's the, the, reasons we, uh, the reasons it got improved. Um, Lollipop added a custom allocator I did not need to lock. Uh, then in Marshmallow, we had fewer um, CAS operations, that uh, atomic operations, uh, that, that have a cost, but we were able to remove a bit of them. Then all of, that, all of that implementation of the allocation path was moved to assembly code in Nougat, uh, which made things even faster. And then finally, in Android Oreo, we, we implemented bump pointer uh, allocation, which meant the only thing you do when you allocate is increment a, po uh, increment a pointer. All right, with that, this is the recommendation that Chet has and that comes from us. So I'll give the same. Creating garbage is okay today. You can use a tab and allocate objects you need. GC is still overhead, uh, so be mindful that if you allocate a lot of objects, then GC will need to run. But it's less, less a problem uh, since Dalvik. And with that, thank you. I will be at the office hours uh, at 1 p.m., so feel free to come and chat there. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dan Galpin. Hey, everyone. All right, just want to let you know we have lunch going on right now because we're on a different schedule today. So once again, lunch will be where it was yesterday, downstairs. And we're going to start our sessions at 1.05. So we're trying to smash as much. Our next generation of components and tools, along with architecture guidance designed to help you accelerate your Android development. So you know that no matter what platform the user is on, tasks are scheduled efficiently and with system-wide health in mind. And we're just getting started. Isn't that something? Learn to architect and develop Android apps in the Kotlin programming language using industry-proven tools and libraries. With these techniques, you'll create apps in less time, writing less code, and with fewer errors. Creating Android apps in Kotlin is a course developed by Google together with Udacity. The course gives you hands-on experience as you build real Android apps using industry best practices with modern app architecture. You'll learn to use Android Jetpack components such as Room for databases, Work Manager for background processing, the new navigation component, and more. 
you'll use key Kotlin features to write your app code more quickly and concisely. Learning to develop on Android is much more than learning APIs and shortcuts. It's training your brain to think like a mobile developer. Come learn with us. For more information on this free course and to see all of Google's courses with Udacity, go to udacity.com slash Google.
Um, good afternoon, people. So welcome to the Android Emulator Deep Dive. I'm Ya Han, and this is Frank. Uh, we are software engineers from the Android Emulator team. So um, back in the days in 2015, in the previous Android Dev Summit, we announced Android Emulator 2.0. So if you remember, here is what it looks like in 2015. And um, it's 2018 now, so things have um, progressed quite pretty fast, and we got a newer emulator with a newer look. So um, if you look at the details, there are a few differences you might have noticed. Um, firstly, there is a frameless skin support in the 2018 emulator, which doesn't have the window frame for you and gives you a better UI experience. And secondly, you might have noticed that in the expanded panel, there is a much longer feature list, which um, we have new features such as um, screen recording and uh, virtual scene support. Um, snapshot and Google Play Store. So I will go over all those features in this talk one by one. Yeah. Um, from 2015 to 2018, um, we have developed quite a lot of stuff in the Android emulators, and we are mainly focusing on two areas. One is the performance improvement of the emulator. The other is um, new features. And we are focusing on improving your day-to-day um, -day developing experience as well as um, CI server testing use cases. So um, first thing first, let's get into performance. The first thing we want to focus on about performance is um, hypervisor support. So just a little bit background about hypervisors. Um, that, that if you are running the Android emulator at the lowest level, you have your um, computer hardware. On top of this, you have your operating system. And the highest level, there is the emulated Android OS. Between the emulated Android OS and your real operating system, there lies the hypervisor, which translates the Android CPU commands into um, your, your OS CPU commands. So um, that, that's the part that we do the CPU acceleration. If you don't have a hypervisor, you can still run the emulator, but everything will go pretty slow, and the emulator will become super sluggish. So um, in 2015, here is the list of the hypervisors we support. On Linux, we have KVM. And on Windows and Mac, we support Hexam with Intel CPU. So um, unfortunately, back in the days, if you are using an AMT CPU on Windows machine, we have um, no support for this combination. So we got a lot of requests from AMD users to add support for them. So it's 2018 now. Things progress pretty fast. And obviously, we have new hypervisor support. So firstly, we support a newer version of Hexam, Hexam 7.3.2 which is stable than the previous version, and it also gives you better performance. Then we added hypervisor hyper framework support for Mac users, which in most situations is um, faster than the um, Hexam on Mac. And at last, we support hypervisor framework, also known as Hyper-V on Windows which can um, emulate an AMD. So, so finally, the combination of AMD and Windows is supported. And yeah, this also gives Docker support. All right, so here is the hypervisor performance. The next thing we want to go into would be the ADB performance. So a little bit background, if you try to push an app from your computer, onto your device when you are debugging or de deploying, you are going to do this ADB push command, which um, copy and transfer the app from one end to the other. So um, here we are showing the chart for ADB push time on a physical device on two different Google apps. 
the Google Photo app and Google Center Checker app. And they are both on physical devices. And you can see what the first thing was that um, if you are using a USB cable and if you are pushing the Google Photo app, it takes you approximately eight seconds. If you are using a USB cable, a USB 3 cable, things go a lot faster and it takes you approximately four seconds. So you can observe similar phenomena when pushing different apps like the Google Center Checker. Um, USB 3 cable is in general a lot faster than USB 2 cable. But those are for physical device. So how about the performance on the emulator? So here is a chart. If you do app push on emulator, the Google Photo apps takes approximately 0 0.5 seconds, which is a lot faster than USB 2 or USB 3. And these are the charts on an Android Oreo device. And it turns out that the OS version matters a lot as well when you are doing the app push. So we got a chart on the new, newer Android Pie device. And if you are working on a physical device, the ADB push is a lot faster on either USB 2 or 3. And emulator still gives you um, a very, the best and very constant performance. So in short, if you are doing the um, app deployment onto the emulator, you are not going to have any worries about either USB cables or Android versions. We have you covered, you always get the best and consistent performance. All right, the next topic, we will go into clipboard and snapshots. So um, we will be showing demos. So with that, let's hand it to Frank. And Thank you, Johan. So a top concern of Android Studio users is the time taken to deploy their app, whether it be to a physical device or emulator. And previously, um, people are used to this workflow where they're inside Studio, and they want to deploy their app, and they need to wait for the emulator to boot up again. So we tried to address this in 2017 and in 2018. The first way we try to address this is through snapshots. We call this quick boot. With Quick Boot, the device state is completely saved when you take a snapshot. And when you take a snapshot when you exit the emulator, and you resume from that snapshot when you start the emulator again. So in a sense, it's kind of like sleeping and resuming a real device. And we've also made improvements in recent emulator canary versions to make it even closer to that. So the demo I'm going to show you here is I have two AVDs set up in the AVD manager. One of them is called API 28, and we're going to be using Quick Boot with that. And the second one is called API 28 Cold Boot, and we're going to cold boot that. And so for the benefit of people who haven't seen this already, I'm going to cold boot one of these AVDs. You'll see that it starts out with a black screen. It takes a while to show the Google logo. but with Quick Boot, the emulator just pops up right here. You'll notice that Logcat has already started up, and we can interact with it immediately, just as the Cold Boot emulator has just started up. All right, so we're just going to get rid of the Cold Boot emulator for now and move on to the next part of the demo. So, in addition to Quick Boot, in July of 2018, we've extended the snapshots feature to be more general. So with Quick Boot, you can only have one snapshot being saved and loaded at any one time. And that can be useful, but maybe sometimes you want to test different device configurations, different device states, and so forth. And before now, you didn't really have a good way to do that. But in the latest emulator stable version, 27.3.10, which was released July 2018, we're now giving you a generic snapshots UI. In this generic snapshots UI, uh, you can save and load snapshots arbitrarily. So for example, I can immediately resume one of these snapshots to 
stopwatch running, and a stopwatch um, is running. I can also edit each one of these snapshots and add notes. And the description is saved and is also displayed over here. I can also take new snapshots with this Take Snapshot button. So these are some examples of what we have been doing with snapshots and trying to make your life easier when you're deploying apps and testing them. I would also like to, at this point, go over some improvements we made to the quick boot mechanism itself in recent emulator canaries. The version of the emulator running right now is 28.0.15. In the recent emulator canaries, we've tried to listen to your concerns about an extremely long saving time for the emulator when you're closing it. Now, if you want to save the emulator, actually, wait, let's just uh, set up this stopwatch again. It's saved. Trust me, it is. Yes, it was saved. So we've employed new technologies like file backing of the guest RAM in order to speed this process up. In addition, we've also added some console commands that are useful for CI users when using snapshots. One very common workflow is to reset the device to a particular previous state, and then run your test, and then reset the device state again. To that end, we've added this command called, in the, in the console, it's called AVD snapshot remap zero. So assuming you're using the default settings, it's like you're auto-saving the current device state all the time. So right now we're on the second, we're at 40 seconds. And so if the first time you run this, it'll save it around then. But the next time you run it, it will very quickly rewind there. So this happens um, quite quickly because all the rest of the emulator UI and all that has already been set up. It's just a device state that's changing. So we can just keep doing this, like uh, rewinding very quickly, and you can be in any state of the device and just keep going back to that one state very quickly with this command. Another feature that we've been working on in recent emulator canaries is launching multiple instances of the same AVD. So let me just uh, set this up again. OK, zero seconds. All right. So before, when you're using the emulator, if you want to test multiple different device states and launch them all at the same time in parallel, your options were pretty limited. You first had to create a whole bunch of AVDs that reflect the different device settings and launch them all in parallel, or and you couldn't even start two instances of the same AVD because you got this error message saying that the AVD was already in use. Well, we have a new command for that now. It's called read-only. Uh, I will show you the command here. Okay. Actually, um, it's missing, but I'll type it again. <laughs> uh, so it is called dash read dash only. And so when you run this command, the emulator will start, but discard all changes. I am starting it in the background just to sh make it easy to start many of them. So I've just started a second one. It's actually overlapped on the first. A third one, a fourth one. And so you have these AVDs that are all running independently, but they're off the same AVD name, because I just use API 28 for each of them. And notice here, I'm printing out the FPS and memory stats. And why are some of these only around 200 or 300 megabytes of resident memory? Well, that goes back to using a file mapping for the guest RAM. In this case, the parts of the guest memory that they share in common that they have not modified yet will be shared and will not occupy proportional set size or resident memory or what have you. So this is called copy and write. It's 
and uh, we hope that this makes your experience developing apps and testing them more streamlined. Thank you. Now back to you, Ahan. Back uh, to the slides. Slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's kind of obvious to see, but here is a comparison of the boot time if you are using the quick boot feature versus if you are doing the code boot. So and in the code boot, it usually takes you more than 20 seconds to do the snapshot save on a MacBook Pro machine as we are demoing today. And on quick boot, um, it, it is usually about one second. So um, back to Frank for the next demo. Mm -hmm. Yep, back to the demo. So the next part starts out with, you've also improved the GPU performance of the emulator in recent uh, versions and in recent years. We worked a lot to bring OpenGL ES2 support very conformant and to support OpenGL ES3. To this end, we've created some benchmark demo apps that showcase what the emulator is capable of. So I'm just starting this test over here. And so you can run pretty like real-time 3D applications like this that are competitive with real device performance. But before we go any further, I'd like to go back to Jahan and the slides to go over another interesting feature. So um, coming back to the snapshot support, if you remember in 2010, the emulator, like even before emulator 2.0, we have a quick boot feature and snapshot support. And at, back in the times, the emulator only supports snapshots for RAM, disk, and CPU. The big missing part here was um, GPU state snapshot. So this eventually forced our users to choose between a hardware GPU emulation and the quick boot feature. If you choose the hardware GPU emulation, you will get a pretty nice runtime performance, but your boot time will suffer and you will need a slow boot. If you choose the quick boot feature, your boot time will be fast, but you will have um, no runtime hardware GPU support, which means the runtime performance will suffer. So um, this is in 2010, and people have always to choose one between the two. And it is 2018 now, we have better version of everything, including the um, hardware GPU snapshot support. This allows our users to choose both the quick boot feature as well as hardware GPU emulation simultaneously. So if you look at what was happening behind the scene for this um, hardware GPU snapshot support. Here is the emulator GPU stack. At the highest level, you got the emulated Android OS, which issued GPU commands. At the lowest level, you got your hardware graphics card, which accept and execute GPU commands. In between them, we have the emulator layer, which we call them translator. So the translator will translate GPU commands from the emulated Android into your hardware um, GPU. When we are doing the GPU snapshot support, we put all our snapshot logic into the translator layer, such that it will serialize its own state and dump them into your snapshot save file. So one big question here was the hardware state which is eventually a black box to the emulator and different vendors implement it differently. So to save and load hardware state, we use standard GL APIs to fetch all the hardware states from, the, from your hardware graphics card into the translator layer. Then the translator layer will serialize all of them and write them into your snapshot file. In this way, we can um, save and recover your whole emulated hardware GPU states. So that's what you want to talk about. All right. Thank you, Johan. Now, in this demo, I like to demonstrate that the GPU state is being snapshotted in its entirety. We didn't ingest 
do something special case for Android UI, it can resume uh, 3D apps like this almost immediately uh, with the snapshot load feature. All right. And you can, for those of you who don't know already, you can rotate the emulator orientation using these rotate buttons. So back to the slides, I would like to show a brief presentation. All right. So I know that many of you know this already, but for the benefit of people in the audience who don't know yet, I would like to recap on some of the basic ways to use the command line to launch the emulator, which can include some useful options if you're running a CI server or otherwise power user. So the emulator resides in your Android SDK folder, Android SDK root slash emulator. And once you're in that directory, you have to give the AVD name using the dash AVD command line option. Note that this name may differ from what's displayed in the AVD manager. So if you want to know what the exact sequence of characters that you need to input there, then you run emulator dash list AVDs. Second, how do you control quick boot? Sometimes you don't want to use snapshots or you don't want to save your changes on exit. Well, got you covered. So the first one, no snapshot load, is to perform a cold boot without attempting to load the current state that is on the device. The second one, quick boot discard changes the snapshot is good for some CI use cases and for people who just want the consistent startup experience and want to wipe it clean when they're done with it. In this, you enter no snapshot save on the command line, and all of the changes to the snapshot will be discarded when you exit the emulator. Finally, if snapshots are just not your thing, you can add no snapshot to the command line, and that will bring the emulator back to the way it was before. And to recap, in the demo I gave earlier, when I was launching multiple instances of the same AVD, well, that is the read-only option. That option will control whether you're allowed to run multiple instances of the same AVD or not. And when you're running in that mode, all of the changes to both the guest virtual disk and to the snapshot, whatever you do, it'll be discarded when you exit. To invoke this, you would run emulator-avd, the AVD name, followed by dash read dash only. And I put an ampersand at the end, you don't have to, to launch it in the background. Um, it's just convenient for demo purposes here. All right. Now, I'd like to also talk about uh, some of the command line options for some of the features that we have introduced recently to the emulator. In particular, screen record. Screen record is a feature where you can record the contents of the emulator to a video file and then play them back using your favorite app. This is great for CI users who want to be able to easily record what's going on when running tests on their app and to easily send reproductions of bugs to stakeholders. So the first set of commands concerns how to start and stop the screen recording. ADV EMU screen record start followed by the path to the file will start the recording. And it is important that you provide the absolute path. Otherwise, you might not get it saved. It's a little confusing. Sorry, we're working on it. The second command, ADV EMU screen record stop, stops the recording and is a signal to save the file. So after you're done with that, you can access the file. The second one, concerns if you don't really want the full video recording part, you can instead just take a screenshot. In this use case, the console command is screen record screenshot, followed by path to the directory where you want the screenshots to be saved. Now let's go to the demo where I will demonstrate the screen recording commands. So we're in the emulator right now, and Let's, let's try to uh, find a different app to, to record. Why don't we start up the camera? All right. 
So we, so that's going on. And I'm going to run this. So uh, ADB emu, ABD screen record, start, users, all of life, my username, documents, dev summit, demo dot webm. So while it's recording, let's just move around in here a little bit, to, uh, make something happen, and stop the recording. Um, OK, that's weird. It kind of. Oh, sorry. I accidentally typed AVD there. Um, yeah, so let's do another recording. All right, so the, the video is saved, and you can open it in your favorite web browser. OK, let's see. Yeah, there we go. So it's a WebM file. It will work in most major browsers. Second, there's also a UI for recording these screens. It is in the extended controls under the Screen Record tab. So in the Screen Record tab, it starts out with a single button, Start Recording. So once we're starting recording, we'll move around a little bit, maybe go to Recents, um, swipe away those apps, and stop. Now once you're done recording, you don't have to save it to a file. You can preview it directly in the extended controls UI. So this is just a video of what we just did. Go to Recents, swipe away the apps, go back to the home screen. But you can still save it in wherever you want. So let's just save this as demo to you. And that similarly works in the browser. OK, so that's one of the features that we've added in 2017 and 2018 is screen recording to make your CI use case is better. Another feature that we've been doing a lot of work on and is pretty exciting is AR Core support. Now, AR Core support consists of a few main components. The first one, as you may have seen already, is the virtual scene camera. With the virtual scene camera, we render a virtual environment which is suitable to image recognition and model placement in AR apps. So I will demonstrate a few of them here. In the background, in Android Studio, I've opened the augmented image AR Core sample. This is available in SceneForm Android SDK from GitHub. And what AR Core provides in it it's not just for the emulator, but there's also integrations in Studio as well. So for example, there's this scene form plugin for Android Studio where we can view models that are meant for use in AR Core apps. In addition, we can change all the material properties we want directly in Studio. So this is the lower left frame, and I might just say, uh, lower the red tint of a bit. OK, I guess that didn't really change the color very much. So I'm going to change blue to 0 as well. So once you save these um, files, the model should get reloaded. And you'll see that it's mostly pure green now. And we can. The workflow, we can just edit this model and deploy it to the device while we wait, I guess. Um, right. And so in this app, we are looking for images to recognize. Another feature that we've added to the emulator for AR core support is the ability to load augmented images. This is in the extended controls panel under the camera tab. Now, we can choose different posters to appear inside the virtual scene. And I've set this JPEG of the Earth to appear both on the table and the wall. 
So once you travel inside the scene with this and turn to face the wall, we're starting to detect the image, and it shows up there. So this shows that we can, if you're a developer of AR apps, you have this end-to-end -end workflow where you can start in studio and do it all in the emulator with a virtual scene camera. So that's pretty cool. Finally, another feature that I would like to mention that I call out, unless if you haven't seen it before, is improved support for updating GMS Core and Google Play services. It is very important to app developers because they need to test how the app will actually run with different versions of GMS Core. If you are using a Google Play Store image, in the extended controls panel, there is a tab called Google Play. And inside it, there is this button that shows both your current GMS Core version and a button to update it. Once you press Update, you will be taken to the Play Store and be given the option to update it. I happen to have updated already, and this is the latest version. So it does not give me a prompt to update here. But if a new version does come out, it would say update. I would also like to talk about the integration of the Play Store and the emulator in general. So this can be useful for app developers who would like to test their app in more end-to-end -end scenarios. For example, if your app requires other apps to be installed in order to work, you can download them from the Play Store directly. Also, you can look at your app in the marketplace and see how users are reacting to it right there and from different device sizes and form factors. And so that concludes the feature demos. So back to you, Jan, in the slides. All right, so um, here is a summary of the features we talk about today. If you might have noticed, there are two channels of the emulator out there. So the first one is the stable channel, which is the one you normally get. The latest update was from July 2018. And the second channel is the Canary channel, which is less stable, but it has all the cutting edge features we have in the emulator and it is released weekly, so feel free to try it out. And in the stable channel, we have this feature, this list of features already released, including more hypervisor supports, quick boot feature, generic snapshot feature, the play stores, and screen recording, and, virtual, and the AR core and virtual sensor supports. If you are trying out the Canary Channel Emulator, you have a few more steps, um, including the faster quick boot feature as we have shown in today's demo, as well as the multi-instance support. And for those of you who are curious about how to switch the channel, here is a quick instruction. In the Android Studio, you can turn on your preference page, and in the update, you have the, your channel switch right there. After that, you go to the emulator download page, and you will see uh, the newer version av available for download. So I believe that concludes our talk. So we'll be QA in the laundry. So um, thanks for attending. Thank you.
Everyone, the next session will begin in 10 minutes.
everyone. Thanks very much for joining today. My name is Fergus Hurley, and I'm the product manager for Android Vitals. I'm really excited to talk to you today about the past, present, and future of Android Vitals. So to start off, what is Android Vitals? I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of it already, but just to make sure, Android Vitals is Google's initiative to help improve the stability and performance of Android devices. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things uh, to be able to improve this. One big part of it is within the Play Console, we now have a section called Android Vitals. And that's where we report to you different performance metrics we're going to, we're going to cover in this talk. How do we actually uh, power this product is uh, an interesting question to start off with. Well, hundreds of millions of users have opted in to sharing their device usage and diagnostics data with uh, Google, and you are partners. And so we uh, share that data in a privacy-compliant way uh, within the product. I'm going to start by going through some lessons we've learned over the last 18 months since we launched Vitals at I.O. last year uh, from top developers out there um, that are big and small um, that have actually uh, used Android Vitals and got a lot of success from using it. So hands up here who wants less one-star ratings. OK, if you don't have your hand up, you might be at the wrong conference, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but most people do, want to avoid them. And what we found when we looked at the review corpus on Google Play, which is pretty large, uh, is that 40% of all one-star reviews where we extract a topic are talking about stability and bugs. And over the past year, the percentage of users talking about stability and bugs in the reviews has gone down by 18% which is pretty amazing. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the developers who have actually contributed to this reduction. The Merge Dragons team, which is behind a very popular Zenga game, they used Android Vials to be able to pinpoint where specifically there was an issue with their application. And this resulted in them being able to reduce their one-star reviews by 50%. The very popular Reddit app used Android Vials to be able to reduce their crash rate by 75%. And they did this um, because they were able to see the category benchmarks in the Play Console Android Vital section. And that was able to make the case with their uh, leadership that they were, uh, had room for improvement. And then when they actually uh, improved their uh, metric, they were able to show leadership, hey, we've actually uh, done what we set out to do. And now we're one of the most stable apps out there. The Lovo team signed up for the anomaly alert emails in the Play Console. And as a result, they got notified as soon as there was an issue uh, with the uh, ANR rate of their application. They had a huge spike caused by an SDK that they were using in their application. And even though you might be building an amazing product yourself and think that it's very stable, I'm sure you use third-party libraries. And some of those could introduce issues in your application. So you want to become aware of these things as soon as possible. And the anomaly alert emails help you with that a lot. They quickly disabled the ads SDK that was causing the issue. And then they shifted a new fix that actually reduced their ANR rate back down to 0.25%. The ABA English team is a pretty small team. And they don't have infinite resources to be able to spend on performance. And we don't think that you should spend all your time focusing on performance either. But we realize that you have to keep an eye on performance all the time and that it might make sense for you to take a quarter to actually just focus on improving the performance of your application um, as, and hold off on doing features. Maybe do that in, as part of your 2019 Q1 planning or do a spring clean uh, for Q2 of next year. Uh, the ABA English team did this, and they spent one quarter of focused effort and reduced their uh, ANR rate by 97% as a result. This uh, and a bunch of other things resulted in them being able to increase their star rating to 4.6 stars. Now, obviously, you can't get a 4.6 star rating by just focusing on vitals, but we guarantee you that you'll never get such a high rating if you have terrible vitals. OK, so I've gone through some examples of individual app developers who are using vitals. What we've actually also done is we looked at, of the top 1,000 uh, apps on Play, uh, we looked at their engagement in the vitals section since I.O. And what we found is that the developers who engaged most in the vital section, like the top 10%, they reduced their crash rate by 50% over that time period. And this isn't just good for those developers and those apps. This is really good for Android end users. This resulted in 3 billion more stable uh, installs on the platform. So we talked about stability. Uh, another major area that users talk about uh, when they leave 
one star uh, rate of use is resource usage issues. And this is uh, battery, network, memory, et cetera. And we have many metrics in the vital section around battery. And some of these metrics are interrelated. So one of the metrics we have is excessive network usage in the background. And so this is bad for users in two ways. It's consuming their data plan, and it's uh, wasting their battery in the background. Uh, we have uh, two metrics that we especially focus on in this area. They're wake-ups and wake-locks. And I'll come back to them in a bit. But the Jamo team focused on their wake-ups rate. And uh, what they say is that they wouldn't have even noticed or been able to fix their excessive wake-ups issue without using Android Vitals. Uh, because we have uh, a lot of insights into your battery usage that there are very few other tools that can actually help you with. Uh, and this resulted in them being able to reduce their excessive wake-up rate by 70%. Great. Now we're going to jump over to how you can actually increase your five-star reviews. And uh, what we find is that over the past year, we've had more users mentioning uh, speed, design, and usability, which is what 70% of the five-star reviews um, talk about when we are able to find topics in them. The Mercado Libre team, which is one of the largest e-commerce um, apps in the world, uh, it's number one in Latin America, uh, they were building a new feature into their application. They required them to ask for a specific permission. Um, this resulted in a bad user experience where users actually had a very high denial rate of this permission. They were able to see that in Android Vitals and then be able to redesign that feature to uh, give users an explanation of why they needed it. Um, that permission, and only ask when the users actually really needed that for that specific feature and not really early on in the process. The Mercado Libre team is a pretty big team, and one of the things they found very useful with files is the ability to be able to keep track on many of the metrics and be able to see that across their startup time, there was a regression introduced, which caused the startup time of their application um, to become very long. And so they were able to then figure out which team has specifically had caused that issue, and then work to be able to debug that issue. The Laveau team um, we used uh, the Android Vital startup time and the Firebase performance monitoring tool to be able to really get deep insights into the startup of their application. So the Android Vitals covers the platform level data collection, but doesn't cover exactly in your application where the issues might occur. And so that's why we encourage you to use Firebase Performance Monitoring as well to be able to understand where specific issues are occurring. They were able to figure out that their login and sign up um, flow was taking way too long, and they decided to do a rewrite of that part of the application. So what's in Vials today? So Vials consists of five performance areas, um, which I think you'll all agree are things that uh, you don't like to have happen when you're using apps. You don't want them to crash. You don't want them to drain all your battery. You don't want them to ha be slow in rendering, um, are requesting permissions that they don't need, or be slow to start. And so we have 15 metrics covering these five performance areas today. And across each of these metrics, we provide three-dimension breakdown at a minimum. So we uh, show you uh, OS version, uh, your ABK breakdown, um, device breakdown, and uh, where relevant, we provide other information as well um, when it's possible. A new feature that we launched uh, at I.O. this year is category benchmarks. Um, this is where you can now be able to see, compared to other apps in your category, how do you stack up, relatively so, to the, your peers across every single metric. And we give you the 25th, 75th, and even the 50th percentile breakdown for each of those uh, category benchmarks. And that can really help you be able to understand, OK, this metric I'm doing OK on, um, and this one I'm actually uh, falling way behind. I need to invest there. I mentioned uh, the anomaly alert emails uh, earlier. Uh, these are available in the console today. You have to opt in to receive them. And so I encourage you, if you're not uh, opted in already, uh, to sign up today and encourage the rest of your team to sign up as well. And this is where we notify you when there's a significant change in the a &R crash rate um, of your application, um, where we have a spike in the clusters, um, are across uh, the core vitals, which I'm going to talk about right now. There are 15 Android vital metrics. It's a lot of metrics. Um, we think all of them are important to deliver the best possible user experience, but some are more important than others. Um, 
As talked about earlier, the uh, leading contributions to one-star reviews are stability issues and battery issues. So we have four core vials that uh, are divided between those two areas. So crash rate and ANR rate, ANR rate being application not responding, are the two stability ones, and stuck partial wake locks and excessive wake-ups being the two in the battery area. For each core vial, we provide you a bad behavior threshold. This is where, if you're above that threshold, you're sort of failing the class. Um, that bad behavior threshold is established by looking at the top 1,000 apps and seeing, OK, the bottom 25% of apps have, uh, are above this rate, and so th that's where the bad behavior is. We launched uh, the pre-launch report a couple of years ago. This is where, when you upload your APK to the Play Console test tracks, we will generate a report within an hour of how your application performs across those uh, different uh, 10 Android devices that we have in the test lab when a robot is navigating your application for about 10 minutes. It gives you a report showing you uh, screenshot clustering and a bunch of insights into accessibility issues and privacy issues, and also flags crashes. One thing we recently did is that we enabled you, when you look at a crash cluster in the vital section, to be able to see if we have a pre-launch report crash that we've detected that matches that crash from the field. This is pretty useful because with the pre-launch report, these are test lab devices, so there aren't the same privacy restrictions in place as there are with the uh, data from the field, of course. And uh, so here, we can be able to show you the video of the robot interacting with your application, so you can be able to quickly reproduce that issue yourself, and we provide a lot more logs and detailed information. We also did the reverse. So we now have the ability to be able to see, when you're looking at a pre-launch report, is this a crash that is already happening in the field, or is this one that maybe just was introduced with my latest APK, but that hasn't actually reached users yet? We have over 100K developers using Android Vitals today. Uh, hands up here who's using Android Vitals. Cool. Great. Thank you guys for using it. Um, one of the things that I found most interesting about uh, this project um, is that we've now expanded the number of users who are using um, performance metrics, or what we call them like engineering metrics. So I was previously working on apps uh, on another team at Google, and I was, also did that external to Google before. And one of the things I really struggled with was understanding how these metrics were doing, because it, you had to um, have the latest version of the code and be able to run the profilers. And now we've made it so that it's really easy for all the people in your company to be able to get access to these performance metrics and be able to see how you're doing relatively so to other people and make the case for investing here versus in other features. I've shown uh, some uh, case studies from different titles um, here. And as you'd expect, you have an Android engineer, head of mobile engineering, and product manager using it. But now we have lead mobile product managers using uh, performance metrics. We have a CTO, VP of product, and even COOs using uh, engineering metrics. And so I encourage you uh, and your teams all to start using these metrics uh, in your conversations um, with your uh, senior leadership and, and with the wider team. Um, and if you don't, probably going to get left behind because uh, quality across the whole Android ecosystem is improving. Now you might think, OK, that's great. Those, that's impacting those other developers, but it's not impacting me. My app is awesome, even though it says it has a high crash rate. I don't believe you. Um, well, <laughs> uh, we looked at uh, the data of uh, users who experience a high crash rate versus users who experience a lower medium crash rate. And what we find is that users who have a higher crash rate for the same app leave 52% more one-star reviews or ratings uh, than users with a lower medium one. And so really, I would encourage you to start using Filestay if you're not. Great. So what is the, in the future of Android Vitals? Well, we've built a lot of features, as you can uh, tell so far. And so really, the future of Android Vitals is you guys <laughs> using the product. And, uh, and so what we're going to do is, right now, we're going to try something different. Um, and I want everyone to stand up um, and uh, talk to the people beside you. So try and find some, yeah, stand up, stand up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and find someone beside you who hopefully you have not worked with, um, and just introduce yourself. And we're going to take two minutes for one person to talk about their vitals and how they're approaching it, and who in their company uses it, what are the best practices they've followed, and then switch role after two minutes. I'll give you two minutes now, and then we'll switch over.
Okay, so if you if you haven't had the other person talk, maybe let's switch over just and we'll do one more minute. Great. So thank, thank you very much, everyone. So yeah, so I hope you learned uh, something uh, from the people you talked to um, and made a new friend, hopefully, as well. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, talk to other people about how they're approaching their vials. Um, there's a lot of documentation available uh, online. Uh, to help you as well. And uh, we'll be at the uh, booth outside um, afterwards, just on the right-hand side when you walk out of this room, uh, if you have any questions um, as well. One of the things that you probably uh, realize talking to the person is that one of the biggest problems with Vitals today is actionability. Um, and we've heard you guys uh, and your feedback. We really appreciate that. And I wanted to assure you that that is something that we're working hard to improve. And uh, we will have more to come on that in the future. We do believe that the data is uh, valid in terms of telling you the direction to go, as in like you're doing good or bad versus other people. Um, but we think we can do better in terms of helping you actually be more efficient at fixing the problem. But that is a really hard problem. Um, and uh, we're working on changes to the whole OS itself. Um, but those things take a while to propagate uh, across the uh, Android user base uh, and then to have enough uh, data to be able to share back with you within the console. But it's definitely something we are working on. I um, want to thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, and uh, best of luck with improving your vials. And I hope I get to share your vial success stories in our talk next year. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Florina Montanescu, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. So in the last few months, together with three of my colleagues, we've been working on bringing Plaid back in fashion. So more precisely, Plaid is an application that was initially developed by my colleague, Nick Butcher, as a way of showcasing material design. And what you see here is actually the state of the app in 2016, when it was pretty much, let's say, Plaid's glory days. So Nick used here a lot of the APIs from the animations, transitions, animated vector drawables. So all of these really made the app shine. They really improved the user experience. So Plaid integrates data from three different sources. And well, these sources from 2016 until now, well, some of them were deprecated. So that meant that uh, out of three sources, we were left with one and a little bit. So from all of these nice, fancy UI features that we had, well, we were left with almost nothing. We, we were left with, with a pretty boring application. So we decided we didn't want to leave it like this. And we decided that we wanted to fix this broken functionality. But apart from this, we also knew that we wanted to go towards something that's modular and extensible from the architecture point of view. But the thing is that Plaid was developed as a UI sample. Not, not as an architecture sample. So you won't be surprised to see all the tight dependencies in the, in the code. And well, code that was actually a bit behind, because Nick started building this in 2014. At that time, we didn't have the guide to app architecture that we released last year. And also, although we had Kotlin, we didn't really use it. So we knew that we wanted to rebuild Plaid, but we wanted to rebuild it in the right way, to have it in a good state for any future changes that we wanted to build. So in this talk, I want to tell you what we've learned and also how we, were managed, how we managed to leverage Kotlin in our app. So we released this opinionated guide to the app architecture. But if you read it, you'll see that it's also still quite vague. So we have these like main classes, some idea of how we should architect our app. But we decided that we want to create some clear guidelines. So we defined some main types of classes in our app. And we also define a set of rules for each of these classes. So let's see which ones these were. So we define a remote data source, whose role is actually to just construct the request data fetch the data from the, from the API service. And that's it. It would only request the information and return the response received. Next, we would have a local data source whose role is just to store data on disk. So it would either do this in shared preferences or in the database. Next, we would have the repository whose role is to fetch and, st and store data. And optionally, it could also do in-memory cache. So the repository will be the class that mediates between the local and the remote data source. Because the, um, the business logic was quite complex, we decided to add another layer. We decided to add use cases. So the role of the use cases is just to process data based on business logic. These would be small, lightweight classes that could be also reused. So the use cases would depend on repositories and or other use cases. Next, we would have a view model. So the view model's role is to expose data to be displayed by the UI and also to trigger actions based on the user's actions. And the view model would depend on use cases. As an input, the view model would get maybe IDs. So it would get IDs in the case where it's a view model for a details screen, for example. And of course, it would get the user's actions as an input. And as an output, it would um, return a live data. Next, in the UI, we would work with activities and XML. So the role of these is to just display the data and to forward actions to the view model. As an input, they would get the optional ID and the user's actions. So we looked at our application or at our architecture, and we divided it into three layers, data, domain, and the UI layer. We decided to go one step further and be a bit more opinionated in the way we're using the data um, or in the libraries that we're using. So we knew that the live data um, really shines when it's used together with an activity or a fragment. So we decided to really keep the live data only between the view model and the UI. And that's it. 
And even more, because of the nice integration between live data and data binding, we decided to also use uh, data binding in our XMLs. But again, still with all of these constraints and all of these guidelines that we've set, there are so many ways in which we can actually implement this kind of architecture. And we knew that Kotlin and the Kotlin language features will help us improve this even more. And more precisely, what we particularly like are the functional constructs that Kotlin supports. So actually, one of the first decisions that we had to make was how do we handle asynchronous operations? And we decided to work with coroutines as the pretty much backbone of our app. Because with coroutines, it's easy to just uh, launch a coroutine and handle the response. And more precisely, what we liked is uh, the fact that coroutines have a scope. So for example, let's say that you're opening the activity, you're triggering a network request. You want to make sure that when you're pressing back and exiting that activity, you're also canceling that network request. So this scope, scoping of the coroutines, was something that we liked. So this meant that we decided that in the view model would be the place where we're launching and we're canceling coroutines. And we're also making that transition between coroutines and live data. But then for all the other layers above the view model, we would just use suspension functions. But these suspension functions would return a result class. So more precisely, this result will have two types, success or error. And this is because we wanted to make sure that we're not throwing exceptions here and there, but rather that these exceptions, those errors, represent a state. So what's, uh, what's interesting in Kotlin is that if you want to um, be able to extend the class, you have to mark it as open. So this means that classes are final by default, and you have to be intentional uh, when using inheritance. So this means that Kotlin really supports this idea, this best practices of uh, favoring composition versus inheritance. But we can do better than using uh, open classes. We can use a sealed class. Because with a sealed class, uh, we can restrict the class hierarchies. It means that we can't extend the class outside this file. So a lot of times when we would use this result class, we will typically use it inside a when. So first of all, when supports smart casts. So this meant that it was easy to do when result is success, do something, when result is error, do something else. But because every time we were using it, we wanted to make sure that we're always handling every case. We wanted to make sure that if, I don't know, by mistake, we're not handling something, we wanted the compiler to tell us that, hey, you forgot something. You forgot to handle the error case. So this meant that the when needs to be exhaustive. But when is exhaustive only when used as an expression. So we added, we created the exhaustive um, property. So more precisely, we created an extension property on T where we're just returning the object. Here's another um, problem that we had. So we had a comment class and a comment with replies. So the difference between these two is in the fact that the comment also holds the information about the user that posted the comment. So it will have the display name and the portrait URL. Whereas the comment with replies is pretty much a tree structure that holds the replies of the comment and the replies of the replies and so on. But what we had to do was to build a comment out of the comment with replies and a user object. So you say, OK, that's easy. We would just create a new constructor that gets as parameters the user and the comment for replies, and that's it. But the thing is that we didn't really like this because the classes were in two different layers. And why should the comment know about the comment with replies? Why should it know necessarily about the user? Maybe the data comes from somewhere else. Why should we need to change this, uh, this API? So what we ended up using is an extension function. So more precisely, we build an extension function to the comment with replies that, based on the user object, it would create a comment. So this, um, when you're building an extension function, you only have access to the, um, to the public um, fields. So this means that we're not, by mistake, accessing or changing any private implementation data. And it allows us to keep our classes focused, focused on what they do without extending them. 
So it meant that we didn't have to change the public API, and we would avoid accessing private implementation details. So what I like about data classes is the fact that they're value objects, and this actually shines in when used in tests. So for example, we had an upvote flag um, in the comment. So when we build a test to check whether a comment is upvoted, we would create our comment with the upvoted flag to false, we would upvote the comment, and then we would uh, check whether the expected result is similar to the comment, the initial comment, but with that upvoted flag to true. But the thing is that, especially in our case, because the comment had so many fields, it was easy to make mistakes, and it was easy to miss what's actually important here, the fact that the upvoted flag has changed. With Kotlin, you can use the copy method. And there, we would just um, create a copy of the object um, and that it's called on, and we're setting the flag, the flag that we're actually changing. And that's it. The code ends up being more concise and more readable, more comprehensible. So let's take another example. So we had another, um, uh, in our app, we were working with a remote data source to post a comment. Um, to post a comment. And here we would expose a suspension function that will return a result. And inside this method, we would create a new comment request, we would trigger that request to the backend, we would await for the response, and then we would handle the response, building either a result success or a result of error, depending on what's needed. But if you look at this code, this is actually not enough. Because in the case when um, your device is offline, this code will crash. So what we actually had to do is to wrap every request inside a try catch. And we have a lot of requests. So we saw that we kept on adding and adding this try catch everywhere. And then our methods were bolted, bloated. So we couldn't really focus on what really mattered, on building the response, triggering the request. So what we did is create a top-level function. So this would be a suspension function that would get as a parameter a suspending lambda and the error message. So here, we would just trigger the call, wrap it inside a try-catch, and then we would build, in case of an exception, a result of error based on the error message we passed in. So that this means that in our remote data source, we could just um, create a safe API call and then put the code that actually matters for us inside another function. Like this, the code became more readable, more easy to understand. So this safe API call, I was saying that it has the call as a first parameter and then the error message as the second one. But in Kotlin, if, you, uh, if the last parameter of a method is a lambda, it means that you can use this um, as a trailing lambda. So that meant that when you're calling this, instead of passing these two parameters, we can just pass the error message as a parameter of the function and then uh, use the trailing lambda syntax to call the method. So like this, the code becomes more concise. But is it really more readable? So when we looked at this, it felt like what matters here the most is the error message, which is not really the case. What matters for us a lot is that the method that gets called is this post comment. So we decided that although the code is more concise, it doesn't mean more readable. So brevity isn't necessarily a good thing. So even if Kotlin offers all of these kind of options and features, be mindful and think whether you actually need all of these or use them in the right places. Here's another um, example. So as soon as we were switching to Kotlin, especially in our activities, the first thing that we did is make all of our views late in it because we didn't want to handle all of this nullability. But then we looked again at our code, and we saw that we shouldn't do this that some views, for example, our no result views, were only inflated when specific conditions are met. So actually, nullability was good. Nullability can be meaningful. Nullability was telling us that something is missing, and we should really handle it. So overall, we saw how all of these features from Kotlin, like coroutines and immutability and functions as first-class citizens can help us shape our app. And together with the guide to app architecture, help us build this maintainable, this safer and faster to develop uh, architecture that we wanted to have. 
Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session on the new multi-camera API. My name is Vineet Modi, and I'm the product manager on the camera platform. Just a quick reminder, after this talk, please step outside to the sandbox area if you'd like to ask us more questions. Before we talk about the new API, let me give a quick update on the state of camera. Historically, most uh, camera apps focus on the native camera app that ships with the device. It turns out, however, that more than twice the amount of camera usage occurs on the apps that you build. And it's extremely important that you support the new features that are available in the new Android APIs. When we speak to a lot of developers, what we find is that the, the number one question is the state of camera to API and where we're going to be going forward. We've been working very hard, and starting with Android P, what you'll find is almost all new devices will support uh, Camera 2 and HAL 3. What this means is when you look at the camera characteristics, you'll find that the device will advertise itself as either Camera 2 Limited, which is similar to a point and shoot, a Camera 2 Full, which offers advanced capabilities like per frame control, and Level 3, which enables YUV reprocessing and RAW. In addition, we've been working with several OEMs or manufacturers to open up new APIs at launch. So we're excited this year that both the Google Pixel 3 and the Huawei Mate 20 series support the new multi-camera API. Now, let me step back and say why this new API is so important. Prior to Android P, as developers, you only get access to one of the physical sensors, where the native camera app gets access to the full hardware capability. But starting with P, you'll get the same access as the native camera app. This includes all the physical sensors plus the logical camera. And the logical camera is an abstraction of all the physical sensors that allows you to easily take advantage of the hardware. There are several new use cases and possibilities with the new multi-camera API. Today, Oscar is going to talk about optical zoom, and uh, Emily is going to cover bokeh. Thank you very much. Oscar is up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Oscar. I work in the developer relations team. And we're going to start off with a live demo. What could go wrong? So here I have a Mate 20 phone. I don't know if you can see the demo right now. Are we on? Nope. Again, what could go wrong? Here we go. All right, so we have here on a Mate 20 phone, um, we are implementing multi camera zoom. What we're doing here is we are swapping at the UI layer the two camera streams. I'm not doing any kind of digital zoom or cropping, I'm simply swapping the streams. As you can see, it's almost instantaneous. There's no tear down and bring up of the camera session, it's just a single session, and I'm swapping the two camera streams. And I have the same thing here on my Pixel phone. And I'll just show you very briefly because it's the exact same demo. But the main idea is that you can see working on, if it works again. Well, had this been working, you will see the same demo. <laughs> In any case, we can go back to the slides. The idea is that, as I said, single camera session, two streams, and we're going to swap between the streams, and we're going to show you how this was built. The key component, though, is that we had the same code running on both devices. As many camera developers know, um, it is quite a feat to have the same code running across such different devices, especially for something as uh, tied to the hardware as it is multi-camera. So first, let's talk about how we can use multiple camera streams simultaneously. The basic guarantee provided by the framework in the multi-camera APIs is that you can use at least 
two physical camera streams at the same time. Recall the guaranteed stream configurations for single camera devices. It is a set of rules based on hardware level, target type, and target size. If we use the multi-camera APIs correctly, we can get an exception to these rules. Let's illustrate this with an example. We have a single YUV stream of maximum size. As per the previous table, devices with limited hardware level will be able to use a single stream with that configuration. If we use the multi-camera APIs, we can actually use two streams of equivalent configuration uh, from the underlying physical cameras. Let's walk through what we need to do to implement the app that we just demoed earlier. We broke it down to five steps. Are you ready? Step number one, find the physical cameras. We start by identifying pairs of physical cameras that can be opened simultaneously. Using the camera characteristics object, we look for the advertised capabilities. And if logical multi-camera is one of them, we know this device is a logical camera. Now that we found a logical camera, we store it. We'll need the ID for later. We'll see. And we get the physical cameras associated with it. Then we can move on to the next step. Here's a visualization of what we just described. We take that logical camera ID, and with the characteristics, we call get physical camera IDs, and now we retrieve the physical cameras associated with that logical camera group. On to the next step, open logical camera. The second step is nothing new. We open the camera. Recall the logical camera ID we saved earlier? That is the only one we use to pass to the camera manager. So to reiterate, we only open the logical camera. The state callback will be triggered when the device is ready. We have now opened the logical camera. In the next step, we'll create the Apple configuration objects. They will be used to create the camera session. For each desired Apple target, we may have a physical camera ID from the list we found earlier if we want to retrieve frames from a specific hardware camera. Let's go into more details. We create the Apple configuration object using our desired Apple target. And if we want to associate that Apple with a specific, a specific physical camera, then we pass the ID in the set physical camera ID API. If we want to use a logical camera, we can simply skip this step. Um, we may also have a combination of both. So at the end of the day, we have a list of Apple configurations, some of which may be associated with physical cameras, some of which logical camera. The goal is to put all the configurations into a single session configuration. As we just explained, each Apple configuration has an associated Apple target and optionally a physical camera ID. Now we create the capture session. How do we create the capture session using the new session configuration object? We start off with our list of Apple configurations that we just created. With that, we instantiate a session configuration, which includes the capture session callback. From that callback, we're going to get an instance of the created camera session. We take that session configuration object and the camera device, which we got from step number two when we opened the logical camera, and we send the framework the request to create a new session with our desired configuration. The callback provided in the session configuration object will be triggered now, and then we'll have our camera session ready to be used. Last step, capture requests. Once that has happened, we can start getting frames out of the cameras. For example, if we want to capture a frame from two physical cameras simultaneously, we take the session we created earlier and a pair of output targets. In this particular case, each target will be associated with a specific camera ID. We create the capture request that we normally do, in this case, using template preview. 
we attach the app targets to it, again, like we normally do. And now we dispatch the capture request. Nothing different here, except in this case, the output surfaces will receive image data from each of the associated physical cameras, and the capture request callback will trigger only once. So again, it's just like any capture request. The big difference is that the completion callback will give me back two start exposure timestamps instead of just a single value from normal capture requests. So to recap, this is how we implement our optical zoom demo. We found the physical cameras. We open the logical camera that is part of that group. We create the output configurations. We put them into a list. We create our capture session. And then we dispatch our capture requests. One more topic I wanted to touch on is lens distortion. A classical example of lens distortion is the fisheye lens. This is not a real example. It is here for illustration purposes only. All lenses have some amount of distortion. For logical cameras, you can assume that that distortion will be minimal. For the most part, it will be corrected by the drivers. However, for physical cameras, distortion can be pretty significant. The physical lens distortion is described in a set of radial and tangential coefficients. The coefficients can be queried using the lens distortion camera characteristics key. The documentation has a lot more details if you are interested. The good news is that there is a way to correct distortion without doing a bunch of math. We can simply set the distortion correction mode on our capture requests. Off means that no distortion is applied. We may need to use this if we want to do things like frame synchronization. Emily will touch on that later. Fast means that the best possible correction is applied while meeting the advertised frame rate. If no fast correction is possible, this may be the same as off. High quality means that distortion will be corrected as much as the lens allows, potentially at the cost of frame rate. If we don't specify a correction mode, it will be either fast or high quality. It is going to be up to the implementation details, which is the default. Uh, you as a developer can query to see which one was applied to your capture request. Let's see a code snippet demonstrating how this lens distortion is set to high quality, which is probably what we want for a still image capture. Assuming we already started our camera session, we instantiate the capture request builder using our desired template. In this case, as I said, image capture. Then we use the camera characteristics to determine if high quality distortion correction mode is available. Now that we know that we have high quality correction for the distortion, we set it on the capture request. And we do what we always do, dispatch the capture request. For more sample code and technical details, take a look at our blog post. Um, we covered this and some more. We published it earlier this week. And now I'll hand it over to Emily. Thanks, Oscar. Uh, my name is Emily Roberts. I'm a partner developer advocate. And I'm going to show you a cool demo that uses some of these multi-camera APIs to do a bouquet effect um, on the Pixel 3. So we actually have three, well, two demos, 2.5 2 demos. Uh, the first one is a single cam demo. There's no multi-camera at all. But I wanted to sort of show the mechanisms for creating the bouquet effect. Then when we get into the dual cam, uh, demo, you'll see exactly, you know, we can focus on the multi-camera aspects and not worry so much about the bouquet effect itself. And um, it's going to be published soon, open source, so don't worry about scribbling down too much code. So can we go to this phone? Demo. Oops. Excuse me. Okie dokie. So we have, I didn't set this up properly. Okay, let's do the single cam bouquet effect. Taking a selfie here. And I think you can see on the screen, it's finding my face. It's cutting it out. Let me bump up the final result. And it's kind of pasting the portrait mode in there. This is kind of a rough cut portrait mode. And I do have an optimization on this. Let's see how that goes. I'll show you the output steps here. 
So it's trying to do a better job of finding the foreground. Hey, it didn't do too bad. It's generating the foreground image, the background, which is just monochromed and blurred a little bit. And come on up, don't let us down. Pasting on the final result. So that's not too bad for a single cam. Let's try the dual cam demo. And with these stage lights, I'm not sure. Come on. Hey, not too bad. We're doing good. So um, you can see a depth map being created in the bottom left-hand corner that's detecting me in the foreground and then the rest of y'all a little bit faded out. You can see the closer folks are gray and then black goes right to the back. You can also see the lights wreaking some havoc. Let me show you the final result. Obviously, there's a few optimizations that can happen, but it's working pretty well. So again, this is using the two front cameras on the Pixel 2. You can see the two streams going at once. Oops. Will this connect back up? No. Anyway, both streams at once, the wide angle lens and the normal angle lens going at the same time. Can we head back to the slides, please? So let's talk about how we do that. Oh, there we are. Anyway, so we had the normal camera and the wide angle lens running at the same time. Again, we're going to publish this on probably GitHub open source so you can dig into it, help us optimize it, make it even better. So the first case, the single cam, let's look at that quickly, the floating head bouquet effect, I call it. We're going to take a photo with face detect. We're going to make two copies so we have background, foreground, do some sort of fancy background effects, and then paste that floating head back where it belongs. Face detect is built into the Camera 2 API. It's quite um, easy in code to implement. First thing we want to do is check the camera characteristics to see if your camera device supports face detect. If it does, uh, you find the mode you want. There is off and then simple and full, depending on your camera device. Then when we make our camera capture request, we just include that in the request. When we get our results, you can see if the mode was set, if you found any faces. And in this example, I just search for the first face that it finds is the one I used. We could imagine expanding this to have multiple faces. Just a note, face detect really grabs the, really the face. So I just bump those bounds out a little bit so it's more of a, a head getting chopped off. Oh, that sounds bad. A head being pasted onto the background. Let's talk about the fun background effects. So you can do what you want here. I did a couple things. First, um, using render script, we just did a blur on the background. And because it's a multi-camera talk, some cameras have a manual zoom. So you could, if you're working with multi-cam, you could do the background with another camera and zoom it way out of focus. So you could actually do an optical blur, which would be kind of cool, and also save you that software step. In this demo, we also did a custom software sepia effect using render script. But if you're using multicam again, lots of cameras have built-in effects like monochrome and sepia that you can query and include in your capture request as well. If you haven't used render script before, it looks something like this. And for our blur effect, we care most about the three middle lines. And it's a built-in script intrinsic blur. It's pretty handy. And it basically works outside the out of the box. In this case, it blurred outside of the box because the box is not blurry. <laughs> this is a custom render script, script um, for the sepia effect. And you can see in those first three lines, basically, we're taking the input red, green, and blue channels, kind of muting the colors, making them a bit yellow, and sending those to the output channels. Okie dokie. So we've got the background. It's got this cool bouquet effect on it. What do we do with the foreground? From face detect, we've got the face cut out, and we just apply a border duff with a linear gradient to make the edges a bit softer. So when we paste it on, it's not that harsh line. And ta-da, paste it on, and things look pretty good. There's a couple of optimizations. One you saw, which is with the grab cut algorithm. This is built into OpenCV, the Open Computer Vision Library that we're using for the depth map demo later on. Basically, I found the face, and then I chose a rectangle a bit larger to try to find, guess where the body might be, and then grab cut does its best, like the magic wand tool in your favorite photo editor, to shrink down that foreground to the actual foreground bounds. We could also, as I mentioned, add in multiple faces. 
Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, let's talk about dual cam bouquet um, with the depth map. We're going to use two cameras simultaneously, and we're going to create a depth map, which is the hard part, which I, well, I highlighted that in bold. But then we go ahead and use the same mechanism we already talked about. Okie dokie, how does this work? First of all, the double capture. So this on the left is, this is me hanging out with my pets at home. The left is the normal camera in the Pixel 3 front cameras, and the right is the wide angle shot. To do that, just as Oscar walked through, we set up multiple output configurations. So for each lens, we set up uh, here, we have the preview surface as well as the image reader. For the normal lens, we use set physical camera ID to the normal lens, and we do the same thing for the wide angle lens. So we end up with four output configurations we're putting into our configuration. From, then, uh, from there, it's just a matter of choosing our output targets for the capture. In this case, we want those photos so we can operate on them. So we say we want the image reader from the normal lens and the wide angle lens. OK, so we have our images. Now we have to do a bunch of math and some magic and make that bokeh effect happen. I want to give a brief introduction to stereo vision before we get into all the code. Um, but I have to say, looking at these slides, working on these slides, I got a little bit bored. I like geometry, but, you know, it's a lot of letters. And I started asking myself, what does P stand for anyway? Obviously, it's a pile of chocolate. P stands for pile of chocolate. And this is what we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this demo. And you know, camera one, it's a little bit boring. Camera two. So S here, we're going to replace with a shark. This is my friend Pepper the shark. And H is hippo. So these are our helpers that are going to help us talk about stereo vision. So left camera, normal lens is Pepper the shark. Wide angle lens is Susie Lou, the couch hippopotamus. And they're both zeroing in on that big pile of chocolate. And already, it's a lot more fun. I hope you agree. So those skewed rectangles there, that's the 2D surface. That's like the image that the cameras are going to capture. In other words, the 2D representation of that real live 3D object we have. Let's take a look at what that looks like. The shark eye view is right in there on the almond, sea salt, and dark chocolate, whereas the hippocam is focused in on the raspberry crunch. So they're both seeing the same 3D object, but they have this 2D representation. And what we really want to do is take their separate views and be able to combine them so we get a little bit more information than that 2D view and be able to cr create a great depth map. So we have, the again, the normal view, the wide angle view. Well, in this case, they're both normal. With the left hand, the right hand overlaid on each other, you get that kind of 3D ruler effect from elementary school that I hope you got to enjoy as a child. And from there, we can create a depth map, which allows you to do really cool things like awesome bouquet effects, as well as know how far away the chocolate is so you can reach out and grab it, obviously. Okie dokie. So those two cameras, those two pictures, are at a different orientation from each other, and they're separated in space. So we need to get those on top of each other. This is what we call the camera extrinsics, how the two cameras relate to each other. So we need to rotate and translate each of those images so they appear on top of each other. Um, normally, we say that we, normally we give the rotation and translation parameters for a camera in relation to world. So instead of camera one to world, we'll have shark to world and hippo to world. But when we're doing stereo vision, what we really need to worry about is shark to hippo. So how are these two cameras related to each other? Like a good engineer, all I know is I have to switch hippo to world to be world to hippo, and now I have this pathway from shark to world to hippo. I hope that was a fun introduction to the math, which you can read all about on Wikipedia and look something like this. Um, to get the rotation matrix, we're going to inverse the rotation matrix for camera two and cross multiply it with camera one. And for translation, it's something like this. Take the inner product and subtract. You can read all about it on Wikipedia or other sources. So one thing I want to just point out if you're working on this yourself is the translation matrix for Pixel 3 from the normal camera to the wide camera. This is what I got out. What do you notice about it? The 9 millimeter separation between the cameras looks just about right. If you look at the phone, you know, there's a good, what's the American, a good. Anyway, there's a good 9 millimeters between those cameras. That makes perfect sense. 
But what I didn't notice, and which cost me about a week of time, is that it's in the Y coordinate, so the cameras are on top of each other. And so while I'm working with this phone, looking at the two cameras beside each other, I just assumed that they were obviously horizontally displaced. No big deal, except that the depth map function that I'm using assumes that they're going to be beside each other. It assumes horizontal displacement. So you just have, because, oh, I didn't say the important part, camera sensors are often optimized for landscape, which makes sense. If you do it wrong, your depth maps don't work. You pull your hair out. You have a great week, like I did. Anyway, just a note if you're implementing this. So we have the camera extrinsics, how we get the pictures from the cameras on top of each other, how they relate to each other. Camera intrinsics are properties of the cameras themselves. So we know we have a normal lens and a wide angle lens, and they have uh, different properties. So there's two things. One is the camera characteristics. This is things like the focal length, the principal axis, and if that axis is skewed for some reason, um, this appears often in a 3x3 three three matrix. And distortion. The wide angle lens and any wide angle lens near the edges especially are going to get a little bit of distortion going on that we need to consider as we're mapping the two images to each other. Another note, so we're going to use the intrinsic distortion properties of the lens to undistort the image. But as Oscar told us, by default, the camera undistorts the image for us. So we're going to undistort it and then re undistort it, which means we're actually going to distort it, which is bad news. So we actually need to turn off the distortion correction if you want to do depth, depth maps. That's easy enough with the, our camera request. We just make sure that distortion mode is off. Okie dokie. So here's the four things. Rotation, translation, the camera characteristics matrix, and the lens distortion. How do you get these properties? It's pretty easy. You just take an entire afternoon, print out a checkerboard sheet, or has anyone in this room done this before? It's called camera, yeah, it's fun, right? It's great. Camera calibration. Take a whole series of shots with both the cameras. You run a bunch of algorithms. You figure out these four camera characteristics. And from then, you can go ahead and start making depth maps from the cameras. You can tell from my cheerful face, it's not actually that fun. Don't do it. <laughs> it's no good. Luckily, in the camera to multi-camera APIs, we have these great fields. Rotation, translation, calibration, and distortion. So you can get it straight out of the API, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm going to just tell you a few notes if you're implementing these yourself. Um, so the camera characteristics, the focal length, and the access information comes in five parameters. This is in the Android documentation. But to create that 3 by 3 matrix, you just have to follow the documentation and plug in the numbers. Another thing that might throw you off is the distortion coefficients. Again, our five values, but the OpenCV library uses them in a different order than the values you get out of the API. So you just need to know that it goes 0, 1, 3, 4, 2. Um, the good news is if you, if you use them in the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 order, when you undistort your images, they look like they've been in a whirlpool. So you're, you're sure something's wrong with those coefficients. Anyway, so once we have all those parameters, we can go ahead and start preparing our images to do a depth map comparison. This is me in my kitchen. And I don't know if you can see from there, but if you look at the ceiling, you'll notice there's kind of a curve going down. We don't live in a fun house. It's the distortion effects we were talking about with the wide angle lens with distortion correction off. As well, when you're comparing two images, the straight lines, well, and the curved lines need to line up in each of the images when you're making a depth map. We call that rectifying, and we use the camera characteristics to do that. That's just showing the, the bent roof. All of these functions are in the open CV library, the open computer vision library. The first one is stereo rectify. This gets a set of parameters we can use to perform these calculations. So we pass in the, uh, sorry, the values we got from the API, the camera matrix, the distortion coefficients, the rotation and translation that we calculated before. We get these parameters out, and we call undistort rectify map, which creates a map telling us how we can take two images from these two different cameras and map them onto each other. And the remap function does just this. So let's see what that gives us. Here is, on the left again, from the normal cam, front cam of the Pixel 3 and the wide angle lens from the Pixel 3. You can see they look pretty good. The shark lines are lined up. Um, the crop is about right. You know, the wide angle has a lot more crop region. That's all lined up. The roof lines, the door lines are straight. There's no wacky distortion. 
And actually, I'd say from where you're sitting, you probably have to look closely to notice that the left-hand picture is a little bit closer to the left-hand side of the frame. So they're actually offset by a little bit, which is just about what you'd expect if you had two cameras nine millimeters apart. So we got the images, we've undistorted, we've rectified them, we're, we're very close to creating the depth maps. All we have to do is call the depth map function. We use stereo BM or stereo SGBM. Um, one has a few more parameters than the other. And when you get to play with the open source demo, you can see how these parameters work and play around with it, optimize them, commit your changes, help make that better. And we call compute and make this step map. And when you do that, you'll get an amazing photo, something like this. Actually, sometimes it looks a lot better than that. But anyway, this isn't quite what we want to work with. What we really want to do is filter that, um, in this case, using a weighted least squares filter, which smooths that out and gives us a little bit more useful depth map. So the darker pixels, as we saw in the demo, are the ones farther back. The whiter pixels are the closer ones. And it's a little, probably a little hard to see. You can see the shark snout and the hippo snout are a little bit grayed out. So it, it's actually working to some extent there. This is how we call the filter. It's um, also included in the OpenCV libraries in the contributor modules. It's all open source. And uh, it's really cool when you get a depth map that is perfect. You're, it's exhilarating. OK, here we have our depth map. What do we do with it? So we can just apply this depth map as a mask on top of it. And the black areas we want to fade out and we want to highlight the foreground. That's pretty easy to do with a porter duff. And the result is something like this. So indeed, the foreground is more present, and then the background is faded out. Personally, I have high standards. I see like a translucent floating shark over my shoulder. My face is a little bit grayed out. My eyeball's missing. So I'm going to put another big red X through this and say, not quite good enough. It's a good start. But what we really want is a depth map more like this. So we're going to put a hard threshold on the depth map and decide foreground, background, that's it. Um, in other apps, you may want to do something similar, but maybe not such a harsh distinction. It could be a, a smoother curve. Um, to do that, we can use the OpenCV function threshold. Um, we give it some cutoff value. Um, for the app, it's somewhere around 80 to 140 out of 255. And that's just that limit where something's considered foreground or background. I wanted to note this in case you're implementing any of this. Um, when we applied the mask, like I showed you, you actually need to turn those black pixels to transparent pixels. Um, so this function just goes through and converts all the black ones to transparency. And. Here we go. We're almost there. So I want to note one thing on this slide. The middle picture, you can see my eye is a bit blacked out. Just remember that for three more slides or so. So we have our initial picture. We've got our depth map. We do this hard threshold on it. And we can again create our background, just like we did in the first demo, blur it out, mono, um, monochrome it, and cut out that foreground. We have all the pieces we need to paste it on, and this is our amazing final portrait shot, which is pretty good. I'm proud of it. So let's talk about an optimization. Um, I remember the eyeball thing I was talking about? So anything kind of gleaming and shiny can get messed up in this current iteration of the application, or bright lights can throw off the depth map generation. And so I did one optimization, which was we have the face detect region. I'm pretty sure I want the face in the foreground. So I just used it and hard cut it in and said anything on the face is going to be in the foreground. So that protected like my teeth and my eye from that, that masking out effect. I don't know if you noticed, can I go back, my fuzzy red hair and the red couch, there we go, they kind of blend in. And so I'm thinking we could use grab cut possibly to do a little bit better job of figuring out exactly what's in the foreground. Thanks a lot. Um, we really hope that this gave you a bit of a deep dive into using Camera 2 and the multi-camera APIs, giving you some exciting creative ideas. We really want to hear your ideas, and we really want to see them in your apps. And we also want to know what features you're looking for. Um, we think they're great. 
and we want to keep pushing the camera ecosystem forward and doing more and more stuff um, really ecosystem wide. Thanks so much again, and please do come to the Sandbox Camera Sandbox if you want to ask us any questions, if you want any follow-ups, you want to try this app and see if it works, and uh, look for it soon, <coughs> open source. Thanks a lot. All right, everyone. Well, now that leads us to our final snack time of the summit. So we have coffee and snacks and coffee and, and fruit and cheese and stuff like that out there for you all. But a few things I wanted to call your attention to. One is please rate these sessions. So we actually have a QR code, which will come up here momentarily. I know. Like, there we are. Look at that. They're incredible. Our team is just uh, amazing. So this is how you tell us how good of a job we've been doing. Let us know what you think of our speakers. Let, let us know what you think of our sessions. Um, one other thing is if you've missed sessions, if you really wanted to see the session that was going on in parallel with this, almost all sessions, all sessions from yesterday are online already. And by the end of today, every single session from today is also going to be online. So you can go home and binge watch all of the things you didn't get to see here at the summit. And uh, uh, finally, uh, come back. make sure to come back here. We've got some great sessions coming on later and uh, both in both rooms. We're still not quite done yet. And uh, enjoy your snack break.
welcome to the 2008.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, deep dive into Android Studio Profilers session. I'm David Herman. I'm Shu Kangzhou. We are engineers from the Profiler team in Android Studio. So before we really got into it, we wanted to give you all an outline of what to expect in this talk. Uh, instead of sort of coming from a high overview, instead, we're going to more narrowly focus on a few features that we think can help you get a better handle on any code base. We're also going to drop some tips and tricks along the way. We're going to be profiling a real app, Santa Tracker. Santa Tracker is an app by Google uh, which allows users to track Santa uh, as, on his course around the world uh, on Christmas Eve. The app also contains games and a couple of other extras. Uh, we're the, they release a new app every year. We're going to be using the one that is publicly available on GitHub. Uh, finally, I want to mention two talks about profilers that were previously given this year, one at Google I.O., which did talk sort of profilers at a higher level, also introducing what was new in Android Studio 3.2 for profilers, and another one at the Android Game Dev, Dev Summit about profiling your games. Uh, that talk focuses a little bit more on performance, native code, related tools, things like that. Um, uh, you can find those uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching this online, we've also included links to those videos in the video description below. If this is your first time coming, uh, ever learning about profilers, you're just curious, here's a very quick overview. The Studio Profilers feature is uh, divided into four main profilers, one for CPU, one for memory, one for network, and one for battery. There's also an event profiler that's on the top of, uh, that's always on the top, which lets you see things like user events, such as taps, uh, keyboard events, screen rotations, and lifecycle events, so when your fragments and activities start and stop. Anyway, that's enough talking. Uh, let's jump into the demo. OK, uh, let's start the demo. So first, with one click of this button, I can launch the app and start profilers. So today, we are using Android Studio 3.4, Canary 3, because that's the latest of what we have. Uh, since they, this is a Canario release, it's not a stable release yet, so there might be some bugs. Please bear with us if anything interesting happens today. Uh, the app we are using today, the Center Tracker, contains only Java apps, J Java code. So the Java apps will be the focus of today's talk. So as you can see in the profiler, we have four profilers, CPU, memory, network, and energy. You can click on any of them and to get more detailed data from that profiler. Let's jump to the CPU profiler. So here, as you can see, uh, in the CPU profiler, you can see the CPU utilization and the threat state. They, they will be useful if you, to tell you when your app becomes CPU bounded. And if you are examining two related threads, one trick is here you can reorder the threads any way you want. To know further data information about which part of your code is executing or how they are executing, you need CPU recordings. And let me get a little bit more space. So as you can see here, there are four types of CPU recordings. So let's go to the first one. It's sample Java methods. Let's get a quick uh, recording of this one. So in, during this type of CPU recording, the Java virtual machine, it periodically will collect the call stacks of all the, all the Java threads in your process. And then it will present the stacks uh, in, the, in, in this part, which we call it's the recording details of the recording. And after the recording is done, the entire recording is automatically selected. And um, if you want to take a closer look, there is a button called um, Zoom to Selection. So if I click it, it will fill the entire screen. And if you want to just see a sub-range of the recording, you can select using your mouse. 
if you want to select the entire recording again, you can click this small clock icon here. And at some sometimes you only want to see a very specific point. Then in that case, you can do a single click in this area, and it will automatically select something here. Now let's take a look of the uh, cost X here. And um, let's select this range. That might be more interesting. So as you can see, um, the provider will color the cost from the Android platform in orange, the method from the Java language in blue, and it will also color any of your code and library code to green. So if you want to know what, language, uh, what method from your code is running, you will be looking for the green stuff. So here we see some green stuff here. And here, if you can see, this is an uh, Android method from the village view class. And if, um, it's not, uh, if you see the code base, uh, you can easily see the village view is responsible to draw the clouds that is on this screen. So as um, one, another thing I want to talk about, about the sampling is you can do some customization about this recording type. So you click this edit configuration um, entry, and you can click this plus sign. You are able to create a customized CPU configuration. For this sample Java method recording type, you can change the sampling intervals. So as most sampling techni techniques go, the more frequently you collect samples, the more likely the data will be representative. However, that will incur more overhead. So sometimes, depending on your use case, you may want to try, have several tries before you find the sweet spot. So as we have seen that the sample Java method is very useful to get a high-level picture of which part of the code is running. In some other scenarios, if you want to focus on a smaller area, another, the second type of the recording, trace Java method, will be more interesting. So let me collect uh, another trace. So in this type of CPU recording, the Java virtual machine is collecting the data every time when the execution enters a method or exits a method. So therefore, there is a lot of more data being collected. Uh, so for example, if I really want to, to understand exactly what methods from my code are running, you, I will look for the green stuff here. And you can see it's more, um, there are a lot of things. And you may want to zoom in. So you can use the WASD keys to zoom in. So the W will be the zoom in. Uh, as you can see, the key I'm pressing. The S will be zoom out. Uh, the D will be moving to the right. A will be moving to the left. So if you're a gamer, you probably already know this. Uh, if you zoom in, let's keep zooming to see what are these uh, green stuff. So here, we see this a big one is the one we just saw before, it's the undraw method from the village view. They are responsible for drawing the clouds. Uh, here, this is the undraw method from the snowflake view class. They are responsible to draw all these snowflakes that are floating around. And if you look at closely, there are uh, some uh, uh, many very tiny green uh, lines here. So you can further zoom in. You can further zoom in. <laughs> You can see, let me zoom in. So you can see this is the Android um, method from the Snowflake class. This is also from the Snowflake class. This is also from Snowflake uh, class. So let's, so you may want to see uh, what exactly does this class go. So you, you right click here, and you can have a menu to jump to the source code. So we, you can see here. In this Snowflake class, Snowflake class, in this Android method, we are doing some calculation about the velocity, about the angle, about the size, then we draw a circle. Then it's clear that every snowflake on this screen will execute this method. That's why 
we are seeing so, um, so many calls into this method. So uh, as you can see, um, trace Java method is very useful to verify whether or not a method has been executed. It's also useful to verify how often that method is executing. Uh, another thing I want to talk about here is about the uh, um, four tabs here. So the first one is the call chart. So the call chart, as we said, is representing all the call stacks during the CPU recording. So, it's, um, so the things to the left, well, let's um, select the entire range. You can see. It. So the things, call stacks shows up to the left will happen first in this recording. So the things to the right will happen later in this recording. In the frame chart, it's similar to the cost, cost stack, but it's upside down, so the root is at the bottom. And also, identify cost stacks are aggregated here. So it's very easy to see the total time a method has been executed. The top down is a tree it has exactly the same data as the frame chart. It's just represented in a view, a different view. So what's nice about this view is you can sort these methods by the time. So the self time is the time executing by the method itself. The children is the time executed by the subroutines called by this method. And the total column is the time, is a combination of the two. Bottom up is looking at the call stack upwards to the caller, basically from the method to, the f to another function to that cottage. So here, you, it's very useful if you expand it. You can, it's very useful to see wh where this um, a method is called and how much time this method has executed when it is called by that specific caller. And there is a third type of CPU recording that is um, sample native uh, functions, C or C++ functions. And let's do a, also another short trace here. And if you remember, I just said uh, this app, Santa Tracker, it contains Java-only code. So therefore, the call stacks, let's zoom in, the call stacks collected by this type of recording is not very, it's not very interesting. They are mostly the system calls. Um, some, some of them are is the Android framework native code. So however, if your app has any native components, this type of recording will be very handy. There is another type of CPU recording called trace system calls. But before I go into the details of that, I will hand back the demo back to Dave. Excellent. So CPU recordings are very useful. However, sometimes there's an exact function or maybe just a couple of functions that you know you want to analyze, and it's a little bit imprecise to record, do something in your app, stop recording, and then zooming in and search for it. Fortunately, we provide a very simple solution for this. And I already added the code uh, in, so let's talk about it. So the debug class is actually part of the Android API. And the debug class and many of its methods have, in fact, been in the Android API since the very first version, including these two. What the start method tracing function does is it asks the system to take a trace, save it with the file name you provide, and then it puts it in a folder somewhere that you can pull off your device later and inspect. That's really nice, but uh, on Studio Profilers, we've got your back. We'll do all of that work for you. Uh, so if you were doing this manually, you'd probably be very careful about the name that you chose. And if you're doing multiple traces, you'd maybe choose unique names so that they didn't override each other. In our case, the name is not going to show up in Studio. We don't really care about it. So call it whatever you want. Here, I'm going to start doing, putting a recording around this function. So what, I, what I'm curious about in this case, there's an activity in Santa Tracker called the city quiz. And the city quiz loads files from the disk. That's usually a really good thing where you want to know how long it's going to take. And if it's doing anything suspicious, maybe it's not. We're going to take a look. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is when you call this start method tracing function, it's doing a trace of your code. This is the 
a more expensive, precise, detailed one. So I'd be very careful. I wouldn't do this around a large amount of code just to make sure that it doesn't take longer than you might expect. All right, let's actually go into the city quiz, which is down here. See what happens. Now, before I do this, I want you to keep your eye over here in the session panel. I'm going to hit play. It's going to run in, and it's automatically going to record. I didn't have to do anything. That's awesome. Let me back out. So as you can see here, there's nothing new. Uh, this is exactly what uh, Xu Kong was just showing you before. It's just another trace, um, but you didn't have to record it yourself. I think this is a good moment to uh, call out the lifecycle events I talked a little bit about at the beginning of the talk. Um, as you can see, we're doing a load here. We left our previous activity, and now we're into this new activity. Uh, you can also see that if you put your mouse over an activity, as of Android Studio 3.3, we'll also include the fragments that are active during that time. So that may be useful for you. But here we are. We're in this space uh, while we're still loading before we've actually entered the activity. Um, and there's another really great feature that I want to show you here, which is this filter button. When I press the filter button, it brings up a search box where I can type into it. Now, I happen to know that JSON uh, has a function called read literal. So let me just type that in. Now, one thing you might notice here is this part of my call chart dimmed out. Um, and all parts of here are not dim. They're, they're still the normal color. So let me zoom in and see if I can find where that is. So there we go. So we can see some instances of this read literal function. Uh, basically, if my function is an exact match, it will bold. If it's a function that calls either into that function or is called out of that function indirectly, the color will be left the same, and otherwise it will dim. Uh, and it's really useful to sort of get a good overview of how much time you're spending in your code on the function that you care about versus what you don't have to pay attention to. All of the CPU detail views uh, support this. So the flame chart has the similar dimming. Uh, top down and bottom up will strip out um, those functions that were dimmed. So if you're ever trying to inspect some sort of method and you're really narrowing down on it, please give the filter option a try and uh, see if you can sort of focus on uh, what you're looking at. Now, the last thing to call attention to here is all of these traces that we've done, if you mouse over them, there's a save button here. So you can actually export your traces. If you do this, you can uh, give it to a coworker, attach it to a bug, useful things like that. If somebody gives you a trace file or you are loading one, you can just hit the plus button over here and load it from file. All right? Okay, cool. So now I'm going to talk about the last type of CPU recording, the trace system calls. Trace system calls, uh, this feature was introduced in Android Studio 3.2, it collects fine-grained system events that's related to app performance. So you can investigate how your app interacts with the system resource. So um, let's collect a system trace. So one thing, again, I'm using the click to zoom button here so that it's very easy to see. Um, one thing I want to show you here, the first thing I want to show you is in this um, threat state view. So if you like, click the range, I zoom to that selection again, then I will click here, do that again. So here, as you can see, you can move, use your mouse, hover over, you can see this threat state is runnable, become running, then become runnable, become running again. So as you can see, we are collecting every CPU scheduling operation. So at this levels of details, it's very easy for you to figure out exactly when your thread becomes blocked. And that could be useful if you have some threading issues. Another thing I want to show using the uh, trace system calls is um, to investigate slow UI junk. So um, slow UI rendering, also called junk by some people. Um, as you may know, uh, that is um, the UI, Android UI does the work in two phases. The first phase happens in the main thread. It determines what is on the screen, including the layout and the draws. It determines the what by executing all the UI elements, such as all the view classes 
in your app. So after the main thread generates the what, they are passed to the native render thread. The render thread will be figure out how to draw them. Then it, the how will be passed to the surface flinger system process and the hardware who is actually performing the drawings. So that's, that is giving that background so we can see under the frame area, we have this main, which represents the main thread. The render represents the render thread. So um, let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see um, here, this, um, this is the first phase. And corresponding, the second phase will be here. If you are targeting a uh, smooth UI, um, smooth UI, uh, animation at 60 frames per second, which is 16 milliseconds, roughly 16 milliseconds per frame. So the two phases combined together should be under 16 frames. If it's longer than that, the profiler will color that frame to red. So as so, you know, this is a something snow. So if you um, zoom out more, you can see a lot of frames. Um, I think everyone in today is red. That means everyone is exceeding the 16 milliseconds threshold. Uh, one, of the reason, one factor is we are using the emulator. Because the way the emulator interacts with the system, you are going to see more red frames from than from an actual device. Before today's talk, I have collected another uh, trace using an actual physical device, and I have exported that trace as a file. And now I want to import that trace to show you. So as Dave said before, you can use this plus sign to import a trace. That's um, this trace. So because when you trace system calls, everything, the system-wide events are collected. So you need to tell the provider which process you want to look at. So we want to look at center tracker. And as you know, the Linux, from the system point of view, every process or every thread, the, your name can no longer than 15 characters. So that's why this one is actually the center tracker dot debug. For some reason, system thinks this is the name. So if you select this one, we are going to import this trace. And here, you can see from the actual device, most of the frames will be in gray. That indicates they are under 16 milliseconds threshold. And some of the frames are in the red because they are over that threshold. Um, you may wonder, how does the system know? I mean, how does the profiler know how long these phases are taking? Uh, that is from the tracing point. So Android platform engineers have added built-in tracing points into the, some of the critical tasks in Android system. So I mean, the example here is if you click the main thread here, uh, these events are showing from the trace events here. So if I zoom in here, you will see this is a trace event called choreographer do frame. So that's the first phase we just talked about in the UI rendering. It happens in the main thread. If you click the render thread, you can see there is an event called draw frame. So that's the second phase. And you can also see there are other um, tracing points in the system. They are all built-in systems, so they are available on any Android phones because they are built-in. And they are very useful to get the timing information for some specific tasks. And actually, you can have your own trace point, too. And I'm going to demo that here. So today, um, so here, if we go into the top of the app, go back to this view, we have the clouds, we have the snowflakes. I want to know exactly how long um, the, um, my code is spent drawing them. So uh, for the cloud, I go to the village view. Um, so there should be a on draw method. So at the beginning of the method, I add the instrumentation. The trace begin section, you need to provide a name, a string, 
which is the section's name. At the end of the method, I will end this trace event. Um, for the snowflakes, it goes to the snowflake view. Again, it should be an undraw method. Um, I want to point out the section name. You should, you, you should pick a name makes sense to you, so you can recognize when you're doing the um, CPU recording. So here we are doing the Snowflake Android Dev Summit 2018. So that makes sense for today's demo. So now I have added the menu instrumentation. So I will rebuild this app and reprofile it. So while we are waiting for the build, you may wonder if I want to know how long that two methods are taking, why don't you use the trace Java methods? That type of CPU recording you are talking about moments ago. So I would say trace Java method is very powerful. It's very easy to use, but it has significant overhead because the Java virtual machine is collecting data every time when the execution enters a method and every time when the execution exits a method. So if you have a lot of frequent small method calls, that overhead can quickly add up and become very expensive. If you use the menu instrumentation, for example, like the trace using the trace API, you have the full control of when and where to collect data. So if you use that wisely, the overhead will be much smaller. And as a result, the data you collected will be more accurate. So let's verify the instrumentation we have. So you go to the CPU provider. Uh, we collect a trace of um, trace system calls. And here we zoom in, we zoom in. We see this event again, choreographer do frame. This is from the main thread that is responsible for all UI elements. And if we keep zooming, so you can see this is the frame. We just added village view, who is joining the clouds. And this is the snowflake view, ADS 2018. That's the thing responsible for joining the snowflakes. So this is the how the use the trace system calls CPU recording. So you may heard a very similar tool called SysTrace. So uh, actually, my Google co coworker, Common, gave a lightning talk yesterday on the SysTrace. So it's an extremely powerful tool, but the learning curve of the SysTrace is a little bit steeper than the Angel Studio Profiler. So you may choose the tools that best suits your needs. OK, that's for the trace, uh, CPU recording. I will hand over the demo back to them. All right, let's leave the CPU profiler behind and jump over to the memory profiler. Uh, first of all, I want to draw everyone's attention to this allocation tracking pulldown. Uh, some quick history here. In Android Studio 3.0, when targeting Android devices with O or newer, uh, what we did is we would collect an allocation, uh, a call stack for every single allocation that your app made. We, we did it because it would be very convenient to, to use, to have that history. Um, however, some of our users reported that profilers were slowing their app down. After we investigated, it turned out to be this feature. So starting in Android 3.3, Android Studio 3.3, uh, we now give you the option to configure this. Uh, let me go ahead and look here. So we have none, sampled, and full. None disables the feature, full enables it. And sampled attempts to collect a subset of the uh, allocations that would sort of gives you a general look for how your app's memory behavior is while not actually affecting your performance as much as a full one does. Now, that being said, whether or not full uh, affects your app or not can depend on the host machine you're running on, uh, whether you're targeting a device or an emulator, or even your code. If your code or if your app code has a lot of small allocations in it, like Santa Tracker does, uh, it can be slow. But I recommend playing around with the features. I'm going to go ahead here and turn full on. Let me go live here. So you notice once I turned on full, this uh, allocation indicator started showing up. 
I want some interesting things to happen, so I'll just go ahead and rotate the device. Let me grab you there. Rotate it back. Move it back over there. So now let's go ahead and take a look here. So all I need to do at any point is just drag across, and I'm going to be able to see all of the allocations and the deallocations that happened during that range. This could be a really lightweight uh, way to sort of get a quick look at what your memory is doing. There's an allocation and deallocation count. Uh, so sometimes you might be able to find memory leaks even just doing this. Um, and then the other nice thing is maybe if you have this on and you're doing some other stuff, you can actually go back in time and select a range and still see what's going in your memory. Now I'm going to go ahead here and turn it back off again. And you'll notice that uh, the allocation indicated that it stopped tracking by doing an empty circle. If I did sampled mode, it would put a half-filled circle. Now looking at these objects, once I click on it, you can see every single one that's currently allocated as, long, as well as the, uh, where it was allocated. This is very useful to sort of get your handle on a code base. You can click around this and see where different objects are coming from. That being said, it might not help you understand why a memory leak happened. What is holding on to my memory? Well, if you want to get that information, you have to go over here to this icon. This is the heap dump icon. And, uh, and click the heap dump. So what I'm actually going to do here, uh, just to let you know, when I, I could not find a leaking activity or fragment in the Santa Tracker app. So full disclosure, I added one. Um, and what I did is I added a memory leak to this penguin swim game here. So actually, let's go ahead and go into the app, or the activity, and leave it. And let me actually do another heap dump. All right, so we're about to get a bunch of heap dump information here. So I know that the fragment inside this activity is called swim fragment. So just like CPU, we have the filter button here. Uh, um, and I can, I can filter out uh, all of the different objects and find that, yep, sure enough, this swimming fragment, uh, fragment is still alive. And I'll click on it. I'll select the active instance. There is a lot going on here, so I'm going to take a moment to sort of explain a little bit, and let's just take a step back and, and, and take a moment to absorb it. So I really want to explain what this depth idea is. So imagine all your Java memory that can be cleaned up by the garbage collector, collector lives in this heap. There are some special Java objects that live outside of this circle. Those are called GC roots. Uh, when you create a new thread, that basically creates this special GC root, or static variables are an instance of a GC root. Um, so what ends up happening is you might, in a thread, create an instance of some class, that it in turn creates an instance of another class, and it in turn, so on and so forth. And so basically what you're doing is you're creating this long chain of objects, and each item in that chain has a further and further depth from the GC root. Now, you may have heard that Cycles are not a problem to the garbage collector. I can point at you, and then you point at you, and you point back at me, but if we can't all be reached, that'll all get removed by the garbage collector. Um, so one of the things to note is when you take a heap dump, you might see a scary amount of things holding on to my, on my instance, but a lot of those are harmless. A lot of them are potentially just cycles. And one way that you can kind of know, it's not always true, but it's a good heuristic, is if there, the depth is greater than your own depth. So let me explain why that is. So imagine that the garbage collection root points to you. You create a child instance, and one of the things you do is you give it your this pointer. So it's pointing back at you. That's a very common thing. Here, you point back at me. You're my child, but you know who your parent is. So that means my depth is then going to be added onto that this pointer's depth. So that's a reason that some of these depths here may indicate that even though you're seeing that it's not an issue. You'll also notice here that there's a few of these items in the depth column where the depth is blank. That means that there's actually no way to reach these at the moment from, the garbage collect from any garbage collection route. So it will eventually be cleaned up. Even though it's showing up in the heap dump right now, you don't have to worry about it. Just ignore it. It's as good as reclaimed. Um, just to make sure we understand this a little bit with a concrete example, I'm actually going to look here at this code which is not the cause of our memory leak. Our depth is one. This, uh, this item's depth is two. 
So what this is saying is somewhere there's an instance of a score view class. And that score view class has a variable called share click listener whose value is me. So let's go ahead and take a look at swimming fragment. And I'm going to search for get score view. Um, so before, when I saw this, I was trying to look through the code. I said, there's got to be some way that I'm going to get a score view that points at me. And there's this get score view method inside my swimming fragment. If I jump to it, what you're going to see is, yep, we create one, and we pass in the this pointer. So that's sort of explaining why there is a cycle there. I don't have to worry about it, but at least it sort of explains why it's showing up in the heap dump. Now you'll also notice that there's a lot of this dollar sign zero symbols. Uh, what's going on here, because you're going to see it a lot, you all know what the this pointer is, but the, if you are an inner class, if you're a nested class, and you need to have access to your outer class's fields, the way that it works is the compiler generates a, uh, a, a synthetic variable, and instead of calling it this, because that's taken, it calls it this dollar sign zero. So this dollar sign zero means the this that's one level out of my scope. And any time you create an inner class that has a reference to uh, its outer class, or you create a closure, an anonymous class instance, it's going to have that. So you know, if you're all using lambdas in your code or, or anonymous classes, you're going to see a lot of these, these zeros. This one has a depth of zero, which means it's a GC root. That makes it really suspicious. So let's jump to the source. Right? Now, hopefully, you know, I might look at this and say, oh, I wrote this long-running task. As you can see, it's not a static class. It's a final class. So if it's not static, it's going to hold on to a reference to the parent class. That's what's going on here. And I might say, oh, this long-running task, I created it, but I forgot to cancel it. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Yep, sure enough, I left it commented out for no good reason. Let me uncomment it there, and let's relaunch. So what we're going to do now is, let me just make sure it's saved. There we go. What we're going to do now is uh, reboot it just to make sure that, in fact, this swimming fragment was released. Uh, one of the things to keep an eye out for when you're hunting for memory leaks is static variables or singleton classes that are holding on to your class, or registering yourself with a listener but re forgetting to remove it, or any of these inner classes that for some reason may not end up you know, stopping and they're still running even though the activity is trying to exit. Are we profiling here? Yes, we are still going. Um, and then another thing I want to mention is it's not always going to be this easy. You're not always going to have this obvious culprit. So in that case, what you're going to want to do is, you know, I would say just try to get to know the code, look for those things that I talked about. Let's go ahead and enter. And we'll exit here while I talk. And, you know, if you've cleaned it up, even if you didn't find it through the heap dump, the heap dump is still going to be the source of truth. It's still going to be the thing that guarantees to you that your memory is actually reclaimed. So I'm going to go ahead here, go back into the memory profiler. I'm going to click on the garbage collector. So you may have noticed these garbage collected events um, automatically at the bottom. So for example, there's a lot there. That's when the garbage collector decided to uh, collect on its own, but you can also click the garbage collection button to manually cause it to, um, to, to, to get run. Now, we still see Swimming Fragment here. Let's see if the depth is actually... So, as you can see, Swimming Fragment is still showing up, which is, I could be nervous, what happened? But the depth column here is blank. Everything is just basically getting, is waiting to be picked up by the garbage collector. Um, you know, you can press the garbage collector a few more times. One trick I like to do is rotate the phone and then rotate it again. Uh, anytime you rotate an Android phone, lots of fun things happen. It tells the garbage collector things are going on. Um, so in that case, let's just do another heap dump here. And we'll see if the swimming fragment is truly well and collected. I wish this came with a drum roll. And there you go. It's gone. So the final thing I want to quickly talk about is if you're looking at the heap dump, you're not always necessarily hunting a uh, memory leak. You might not know some major class to look out for. So there's this concept of shallow size and retain size. So shallow size is the size of a single instance of some class um, that it's, that's been allocated. And retain size is all of the things it's holding on to. So what you may want to do is uh, hunt, sort your shallow size, sort your retained size, maybe investigate to see if there's any sort of suspicious 
uh, memory things there, or maybe you can clean up your design and remove some memory there earlier. Anyway, that ends our demo. Hand back to Xu Kang. Let's go to the slides. OK, cool. Um, so to recap, in today's demo, we have shown to use CPU profiler and memory profiler to get a better understanding of the code base of the center, center tracker app. And to be honest, Dave and I don't know much about it before we are preparing for this talk. And we also have shown that we don't only use profilers to diagnose performance issues. We also use profilers to help us understand the performance of this app. As we said before, there are also network and energy providers in Android Studio, but unfortunately, we don't have time to cover them today. So please refer to our online documents and talks to learn more. So we hope you have learned some tricks and tips from our demo today. We hope they are useful when you approach your own code base with Angel Studio profilers at your side. Thank you very much for attending our talk. Everyone, the next session will begin in 10 minutes.
Everybody, as they say, the best goes last. And here we are to talk about testing Android apps at scale. My name is Stefan Linzer, and I'm a software engineer at Google. And with me backstage is Vishal Sedia, who's also a software engineer at Google. So at Google, we believe in diversity and inclusion. And we build our products for everyone. But for us developers, this means we also have to test for everyone. So let me tell you a little bit how we develop and test software at Google. But before I start, I want to talk a little bit about the scale that we do Android development here at Google. We have about 100 plus Android apps. This includes all the billion user apps, such, such as Google Photos, Maps, YouTube, Gmail, Search. We have a combined 2 billion lines of code, and we run 20,000 Android builds every single day. And we have a staggering 27 million test invocations per day. So how do we create these high-quality apps, and how do we maintain this quality over such a long time? I think one of the key things here is our engineering culture. A typical developer workflow at Google looks a little bit like this. We have a strong code reviewing culture. Code reviews are very, very thorough. And before you can actually submit your change or pull request, you have to get at least reviewed by one of your peers. Another important thing is that all development happens at head, and everything is built from source. And we have a large mono repo, which allows us to easily search for code, reuse code, but it also allows us to keep the repo healthy by sending so uh, called large scale changes. We also have a very strong testing culture. At Google, if you have a change, you have to have tests. And even more importantly, all of those tests have to pass before you submit your change. To run tests, we use a large-scale distributed CI system, which does not only run your tests, but also all of the tests from code that depends on your change. Another thing that is very unique about Google is that we have a strong <clears throat> engineering productivity culture. So that means we have dedicated teams that only work on infrastructure tools and APIs to make developers productive. We are part of such a team, and we have been working on testing Android apps or Android app testing um, at Google. So I want <clears throat> to take you a walk down memory lane what we have done at Google to scale Android testing. So in about 2011, a lot of teams at Google actually started to build for Android because Android was becoming more and more popular. So at the time, they were just using the standard tool chain. They were using Ant to build their apps, and they were using Eclipse as an editor. But with a growing number of teams, we also added support to our internal build system. One of the problems that became obvious very early on was the need for scalable testing. And so we actually started off very simple by building a small host site test runner that would run on the host. And in fact, it was just a JUnit 3 test suite that would literally scan an APK, list the tests, and give it to our instrumentation test runner that was running on the device to execute the test. Once we had that, we actually built it into our continuous integration system. One of the key decisions that we made very early on was to use emulators, we called them virtual devices, to run tests at scale. Because obviously, it makes more sense, because you can scale a data center, but you can probably not scale a USB hub so easily. So we wrote this little Python script, probably just 20 lines of code, and I'm sure many of you have been there, that boots up an emulator for us that allows us to run the tests and shut it down afterwards. So while we were working on infrastructure, our engineers actually started, started to write tests, and they wrote a lot of them. A key problem here was especially around functional UI testing. And as many of you will remember, in the early days, you only had the low-level framework APIs. You had Activity Monitor to track activities. You had Instrumentation run on UI thread or the infamous wait until idle sync. 
And even though these methods, uh, these APIs, were, were easy to use, developers struggled a lot writing uh, reliable UI tests. And at the time, we thought, OK, maybe we could find something better. And we actually found that in a community with Robotium. So we brought Robotium into Google, and it improved things. And we used it for about a year until the end of 2012. But it had its own issues with the API surface. And it didn't solve one of our key issues, which was synchronization. And that's when we started to work on Espresso, because we wanted a framework that was easy to use for developers, but more importantly, was hiding all the complexity of instrumentation testing from the developer. So at that point, we kind of had a decent setup for instrumentation tests, but we still had to solve the unit testing problem. Because as you remember, at the time, all of your unit tests, you usually ran them on the device. But that is expensive, and they tend to be slower than running on the JVM. So again, we reached for a solution that the community had already built at the time, which was RoboElectric. And RoboElectric allowed our developers to do fast, iterative, local development. And it's actually still one of the most popular frameworks for unit testing within Google. So in 2014, we actually had built a lot of experience in testing APIs. But we were seeing that the community was struggling you know, from the same problems that we did. That's why we decided to bundle all of our libraries together in the Android testing support library, which then quickly became the default library for developers to write instrumentation tests. Fast forward to today, we just launched Android X Test 1.0. It's not only our first stable release, it's also the first time where we ship unified APIs that allow you to write tests once and run them anywhere. And by the way, we just achieved a major milestone here at Google. We now run 10 billion unit and instrumentation tests every year on our infrastructure. So looking back at those seven years, what would we do differently? There's a couple of things I want to mention here. So we would probably design for any build system. We made some key decisions very early on that tightly coupled us to Google's internal build system. But it quickly became a problem, because even at Google, not everybody's using Google's internal build system. And we weren't able to share our, uh, our host site infrastructure with them, but also not with the community, and we couldn't open source it. Similarly, we didn't build some of the tools that we've built weren't cross-platform. So they only worked on Linux, but not Mac and Windows. Another thing that we would probably do differently, even though retrospectively, it probably was a good thing that we started off small and then scaled up our testing. But while the apps grew and the ecosystem grew, there were more and more requirements. And we usually just built them into our infrastructure. But we didn't have a mechanism for teams to customize this infrastructure. This led to a point where we suffered from high code complexity. It was hard to maintain. And some features couldn't be removed, but they weren't used anymore. The last thing I want to mention here is configuration. Our host site infrastructure was getting configuration from many different sources. So we had flags, system environment variables, and config files. And this made it very hard to track down bugs in the infrastructure itself. So about a year ago, our team sat down with app teams in Google, and we wanted to learn about, about the past and the future, and especially how the Android testing landscape had changed. And so what we came up with to solve some of the problems that came out of the discussion was Project Nitrogen. Project Nitrogen is our new unified testing platform, which we first talked about at I.O. this year, and which we will ship to you in 2019. Project Nitrogen is currently used by a small number of apps inside of Google, and we're slowly scaling it up to some of the biggest apps in the world. And the reason why we're doing this is simply because we want to battle test it first before we ship it to you. But the point being here is we want to give all this infrastructure that we use to run 10 billion tests to you. <clears throat> so Nitrogen solves many problems. But two of the key issues that we're trying to solve with Nitrogen is, first, we want to create a unified entry point 
into Android development. And secondly, we want you to enable to write tests with a unified API and move them between layers. If you think about Android testing today, it looks a little bit like this, right? You have tools on the left-hand side, such as Android Studio, Gradle. You have your CI server, and maybe even another build system, such as Bazel. On the other end of the spectrum, you have all the different runtimes that you want to run on. We call runtime device, uh, devices in Nitrogen. So you want to run your test on a simulated device, or a virtual or physical device, or even on a remote device that runs in a device lab, such as Firebase Test Lab. But in order to do so, you have many different entry points. And it looks a little bit like this. You have a different configuration for every tool. You have different roles. You have different tasks. And it just becomes a nightmare to maintain. And actually, what we see in Google is, because it's so hard to move from one to the other, they would skew towards one type of a test or another. So what we want to do with Nitrogen is we want to have a unified entry point. And Nitrogen itself is just a standalone binary, a standalone tool, which infrastructure developers can use to really customize their infrastructure. But obviously, there's also all these other developers who don't work on infrastructure and work on actual app code. For them, we want to provide integrations into all the tools on the left-hand side to make it easy to run tests. And at that point, if you have a single entry point and a unified test, it fits very well within your developer workflow, because you can do local, fast, iterative development on a simulated device. Then in pre-submit, before you actually submit your change, you can run on an emulator matrix. And lastly, in post-submit, you can run on a remote device, a physical device in Firebase Test Lab. And that's really what we're trying to do with Nitrogen. Nitrogen allows you to run tests at scale. It is highly configurable. It was built with customization and extensibility in mind. You can execute unit and instrumentation tests. It vastly improves reporting and therefore debugging. And maybe one of the most exciting things is it ships with its own virtual device management solution that manages devices for you. <clears throat> and that's actually something I think a lot of people in the community have been asking for us for quite a while. So Nitrogen is cross-platform. And we really build it from the ground up with all the experience that we have uh, seven years in host-side and device-side infrastructure. It will support Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it's written in Kotlin. And we really build it in a way such that we hopefully, that it's hopefully going to be good for the next seven years. Nitrogen, as I was saying, is just a standalone tool. So it can be easily integrated into any build system. And we're working on integrations for Gradle, Bazel, and Bazel. We're adding sharding and parallel test execution. And continuous integration support will be there from the start. On the device side, we're initially planning to have support for at least simulated virtual and physical devices, as well as device labs such as Firebase Test Lab. And you can even add your custom devices if you have custom hardware. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the high-level architecture of Nitrogen. So Nitrogen is basically split into two parts. We have a host site infrastructure that is all the, coast, uh, all the code that runs on a host. And we've done something new. We also have an on-device infrastructure, which basically means we've moved some of our infrastructure onto, onto the device, which is a much saner environment to reason about. And the device is also the main abstraction that we use in Nitrogen for different runtimes. So the host side runner is mostly responsible for finding a device for you, setting up the device for test execution, and then requesting a test run. It can be easily configured with a proto buffer 
configuration, and it allows you to customize things like the test executor and the whole test harness. To decouple the host from the device, we have a new orchestrator service. You can think of it as the brain of test execution that runs on a device. And it's responsible for discovery, filtering, and sorting, and execution. An orchestrator service is just a gRPC service that can be implemented by any device. And we, in fact, use gRPC to communicate between the host and the device which does not give us performance and speed. It also gives us a lot of stability, and it allows us to stream test results back to the host in real time. We also have a lot of extension points. So we'll have host plugins that allow you to run code on a host. And we'll also have device plugins that allow you to run code on a device. So let's dive into each of these sections. As I mentioned before, we use a single proto configuration with a declarative set of protos. This allows you to define devices, your test fixtures, so you can define things like APKs that you want to install, data dependencies that you want to push on the device. And it can declare your host and device plugins. We initially will have support for single device executors, parallel device executors, to run on um, multiple devices in parallel. And we'll also have a new multi-device executor, which will allow you to do things like um, orchestrating a test run between a device and a device, or a device and a watch, which is something that we increasingly see as a requirement. The good news is, if you're just an app developer, you usually don't have to deal with any of this configuration because it's built in in the tool integration. But if you're an infrastructure developer, this is where it gets really interesting for you because you can customize every single bit of nitrogen. Let's talk a little bit about plugins. So host plugins are plugins that can execute code on the host. Plugins that we've already built are the Android plugin. They just encapsulate all the code that allows us to run Android tests on a device. We have a data plugin that allows us to stage data onto the device, or a fixer script plugin, which allows us to execute fixer scripts on a device. And you can have your custom plugins. Custom plugins can have their own configuration. And with host plugins, you can actually run before the test suite starts and after the test suite is finished. The reason why we do it this way is because we want to avoid the chattiness between the host and the device. If you look at the after all method, you will also get access to the whole test suite result, which is great if you want to do any post-processing of your test results. And you even can submit an edit request back to us if you want to attach new artifacts to the test suite result. Device plugins, on the other hand, like the name is saying, run, are running on an actual device, which is a much more sane environment to reason about. And in fact, most of our host side code that we used to configure the device is now moved to the device with a device plugin. So plugins that we've already built are a Lockhead plugin that gives you a scoped Lockhead per test method, a screenshot plugin that takes screenshots in case your tests fail, or a permission plugin, which is pretty awesome because you can now grant and revoke runtime permissions, which was not able before. And you can obviously also have your custom plugins. So the difference from a device plugin to a host plugin is that it runs on a device. But this allows us to do things like that. We can give you a callback before a single test method is executed and after it's finished. And this is great, because we can avoid all the chattiness between the host and the device. And it gives you a lot of control. And if you think about it, 
I don't know how you set up your test fixtures now, but usually you would basically use something like at before class or at before, at after, at after class. Or if you want something more reusable, you would probably reach for a JUnit rule or there are some things you can't do with these APIs. And then you have to have your custom runner. And I think the great thing about this is we give you a whole new way of writing uh, plugins that actually run on a device and allow you to execute code on it. So let's move on to execution. So as I was saying, we moved the execution to the actual device. And we created a whole new orchestrator service and protocol. What this does, it standardizes the communication between the host and the device. And it can be implemented by any device, which means if you have a custom device, you can implement the same protocol, and you can still integrate with the host site easily. On Android, the orchestrator service is implemented by the Android test orchestrator. And once you request a test run on the host, it will then go, discover all the tests, apply any filters and sorting that you want, and then it will do either isolated or batched test execution. It will also call all your device plugins, and it will stream results back in real time to the host. So the last thing that I want to talk about is reporting. So with Nitrogen, we will give you unified and consistent reporting. As I'm sure many of you have seen this command at the top. What it does is it runs an instrumentation test from the command line. If you use the dash R option, which is verbose mode, you'll get an output like this. And as you can see, it's not very human readable, I would say. And it's also quite chatty, because this is just showing a single test. And this is showing a passing test. If it fails, the only thing that it gives you in addition is a stack trace. So there's not really a lot of information or actionable data here to why the test failed. With Nitrogen, we, wanna, we want to move to something like this, a structured data format, which gives you access to the properties of the test case, the status of the test, and the list of artifacts that were collected during the test run. Things like screenshots, video, lockhead, and any custom artifacts that you add in your post-processing. Again, this will also be integrated in Android Studio, and we will surface this in the Android Studio UI if you run tests. The last thing before I wrap up, what I want to mention is we also have support for custom reports. So you can do things like JNIT XML or even your custom report that integrates better with your own infrastructure. And with that, I want to hand over to Vishal, who's going to talk about device management. All right. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs> Running any kind of Android UI test generally happens on devices. There are two different device types where you could run your test, either on a physical device or a virtual device. Regardless of which device type you run your test on, it, each of them has its own sets of pros and cons. Let's just do a quick show of hands. How many people around here have had set up something like this, you know, testing on physical devices? <laughs> Looks like quite a few. A follow-up question. How easy was it to manage them? Hard? Yeah? Another follow-up question. Did you ever end up using a fire extinguisher next to it? <laughs> I seriously hope not. I have a funny story to share that happened a few years ago at Google when one of the teams decided that they wanted to test their stuff on physical devices. They procured a bunch of devices, glued them onto the wall, and, and integrated it with their CI infrastructure. Everything was running reasonably well until one fine day when the engineers came back to work on a Monday morning and things were timing out. If you were to guess what went wrong, what would be your guess look like? <laughs> okay, so it turned out to be an air conditioner problem. 
So what apparently happened was uh, the air conditioners in the building in San Francisco went bad. Uh, and because the air conditioners went bad, the facilities decided that they want to switch off the air conditioner so that they could fix it. But tests were continuously running on those devices, and the heat produced in those devices caused the glue to peel off from the, from the wall, and all the devices fell off to the ground. <laughs> Managing physical devices are hard. I just want to give out a huge shout out to the Firebase Test Lab team that makes testing on Firebase Test Lab so much easier for you folks. How do we solve this at Google? At Google, we use the virtual device infrastructure. The test environment that we use is extremely stable. The number that you look at the right is the stability ratio of our test environment. And that's right, it's 99.9999%. The continuous integration, in, uh, the virtual device infrastructure that we use uh, has the ability to run locally or in a CI environment. And it supports over 500 different device configurations. Let's dig in a little deeper to see what, what is its current state at Google. It's used by over 100 first-party apps, such as Google Photos, Search, YouTube, and so on and so forth. Uh, just in 2018, it had a staggering 2.4 billion invocations, and that number is growing year over year. There are over 120,000 targets that use this infrastructure. Having a great test infrastructure is a must if you want to release high-quality apps. You'd be thinking, this is great infrastructure. How does this fit in with nitrogen? If you remember uh, from slides that uh, Stefan presented a little bit earlier, Nitrogen has this concept of device providers. So if you want to run a UI test, you would invoke Nitrogen. Nitrogen, in turn, would invoke a device provider, which in this case is going to be the virtual device provider, which launches a device, does a bunch of smart setup, returns the control back to Nitrogen, which, act which actually goes and executes the test. And once the test is done, it goes and tears down the device. So in that case, you get a completely stable environment, which, which is launched by Nitrogen, runs the test, and shuts it down. So wh while designing this particular infrastructure, there were four key things that we kept in mind. The, the virtual device infrastructure needs to be simple to use, needs to be extremely stable. We should be, uh, it should be reproducible, regardless of which environment it runs in, whether you're running it locally or whether you're running it in your CI infrastructure. And it needs to be extremely fast. Let's dig in into a little deeper as to how did we achieve each of these four goals in building a virtual device management solution. So uh, the, the virtual device infrastructure uh, has a very simple proto configuration. What does that mean? It's just a configuration file where you could go and add the characteristics of the device. For example, what's the horizontal screen resolution? What's the vertical screen resolution? What's the memory of the device? So for each of these different device types, like Nexus and Pixel, uh, the virtual device management solution already has pre-baked in all of these different device configurations. So you don't have to go and figure out the different device resolutions for each of those devices. It supports over 500 different device configurations. And because it's a configuration file, it's a matter of just adding or removing the uh, changes to the configuration file. And it supports several different form factors, such as phones, tablets, TV devices, and wear devices. But how is it simple? Uh, Launching it is as simple as calling the virtual device binary and specifying the name of the device. So if you want to launch a Pixel 2, you just say virtual device, device equals Pixel 2, and on what API level. You don't have to worry about uh, creating AVDs, specifying configurations, and things like that. That makes things extremely simple. Stability. This is probably one of the biggest problems most of the Android app developers face. Like, you're running your test, and an ANR pops up. And that ANR might not even necessarily be the app that you're testing. We had the same problem internally as well. All right, how did we solve this? Um, well, sorry. Android has a nifty service called as Activity Controller that lets you suppress ANRs whenever it sees them. This is the exact same uh, service that Android Monkey uses while it runs Monkey tests. This increased our stability of our test tremendously. Like one of the things that I forgot to say, when we started with this particular infrastructure, uh, our stability was around 95%. But that's no good when you're running things at scale. So the first thing that we saw were ANRs. And once we fixed that, our stability increased, but still not to the level that we wanted. The next flaky things that we saw was we boot up a device, but the screen is not unlocked. And if the screen is not unlocked, all the key events that you inject does not even reach your app. And if the key events don't reach your app, your app is actually not getting tested, and your test is starting to fail. And it turned out when the device boots up, the screen is not uh, locked. So in, the screen is not unlocked. 
In API level 23, I believe, Android added an API for our, for our window manager where you could dismiss the key guard, and that would unlock the screen. So every time we booted the device, we would call the window manager API to unlock the screen. And this increased our stability furthermore. A few years ago, Android changed the file system from YAFFS, which meant yet another flash file system, to ext4. This was a great improvement, but it had its own set of problems. ext4 was, known, was prone to disk corruption during a hard shutdown. So whenever we would shut down the device, if it was not correctly shut down and it had disk errors, your subsequent boot of the virtual device would fail, leading to test flakiness. How did we solve this problem? Well, all we had to do was call in FSEC to the disk image that was unmounted, and this kind of guaranteed that when the disk was unmounted, it had no disk errors, and if there were no disk errors, your subsequent boot would come up just fine. This increased the stability of our uh, test environment to close to 99%, but that's still no good. When you're running at 2.4 billion invocations, a one-person failure is 24 million. And that's still a huge number. As you can see, there were a bunch of optimizations that we did to increase the stability. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there's one final thing that I want to talk about. We would launch the device, but for, and uh, the virtual device would set a boot property saying that the device is completely booted up. But for whatever reasons, the launcher would not kick in. Now, so how did we solve that problem? Well, all we had to do was send out an intent to the launcher. Uh, if it was already launched, then it was a no-op. If, if it wasn't launched, then it started the launcher, and then we would return the control back to Nitrogen, which would then go and uh, run the test. Doing a bunch of optimizations like this helped us get to 99.9999% stability. The next big pillar the next big pillar that we had in mind was reproducibility. So a lot of times when users were running their tests in CI environment, if their test failed for whatever reasons, they had no way of debugging it locally. So our, the virtual device environment that we built uh, had to make sure that the environment was reproducible regardless of where they are running. So the virtual device management solution helps you launch things locally or on the cloud. And one of the big the big things about this environment is the device starts in a clean, pristine state for every invocation. So there is no state carry forward between different invocations, making sure like tests are going to be extremely stable and not fail because of the device itself. And our child. There are several teams within Google that write NDK code, like when you're writing native code, and they wanted to test their native code. But to test their native code, they wanted to boot up ARM devices. And booting up ARM devices were extremely slow. For example, on Nougat, booting up an ARM device takes about 10 minutes. And this was slowing teams down tremendously. This, helped, this made us go back to the drawing board to see what could we do to, increase the, to decrease the time it takes to boot up those devices. So we ended up going and created a mini boot mode in the virtual device. What does mini boot mode mean? We, like for testing native code, you don't need the entire Android stack to be up and running. All you need is technically the Linux kernel, and if the kernel is up and running, you could test your native APIs. So we ended up, and, uh, we ended up adding a mini boot mode to our virtual device launcher, which would come up in less than 30 seconds, and that would uh, help the, the NDK developers to test their native code much more quickly. At Google, we make a lot of data-driven decisions. So because we were running things at scale, we were looking where we were spending bulk of our time while running our test. And it turned out 50% of our time was spent in booting up the emulator. 30% of the time was spent in installing an app because of a process called STX2O. Uh, and 20% of the time was spent in running the test itself. Android made a change bet uh, between Lollipop and, and Nougat, where they wanted to do ahead-of-time compilation using a tool called STX2O. And so, what we, so because the app installation times were so huge, uh, what we ended up doing was you have the exact same device, the exact same app under test that's being tested, and the exact same dex 2 out file, that, the exact same out file being generated for every test invocation. What we said was, what if, if we move this as a single uh, action as a, on, a, on the Bazel build graph and reuse the old file that was generated for all your test runs. This significantly reduced the app install time from over three minutes for one of the apps to under a minute. If you were here earlier today when the emulator team presented about snapshots, where you could boot up an emulator, 
safety snapshot and then shut down the emulator. And when you restart it, it restarts back from the same state. Well, we integrated the snapshot feature back into Virtual Device Launcher, uh, where you boot up a device, take a snapshot, uh, shut it down, and then reuse it when the test actually runs. This significantly reduced our test run times by over 30%. Just imagine, when you run tests at 2.4 billion invocations, reducing test times by 30% would yield a huge number of, like, you would you'd save huge amounts of CPU resources. One of the other features that we are going to work uh, pro probably next year is Cloud Snapshots, which is a combination of text to on the cloud and snapshots called Cloud Snapshots. With this, we come to our end of our talk, where with Nitrogen, you'd be able to run your tests at scale in a completely stable environment with all of these different pillars. This is our next generation platform that would help you test. In this talk, we did do a lot of technical stuff like deck stump, FSEC, activity controller. You don't have to worry about any of those things, because all of these things are already incorporated in Nitrogen as well as the virtual device management solution. And all you would have to do is like use this. Uh, so we are hoping to release Nitrogen uh, Alpha in Q1 of next year. Uh, the virtual device management solution is going to be released around the same time as well with an alpha release. Firebase Test Lab is actually integrating with Nitrogen as well to run your tests. Um, one of the things that Stefan pointed out earlier about integration of Ni Android Studio and Gradle with Nitrogen. S uh, just imagine you're sitting in front of your Android Studio, you hit the Run Test button, which actually invokes Nitrogen, which could actually launch the virtual device, run your test, and give you results back on your Android Studio itself. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Is that it? All right. Well, hey, everyone. Um, I wanted to thank you all for coming and attending the Android Dev Summit. It is uh, really, really amazing to be able to do this again. We really want to know what you think, and this is really important. So all of you should, by now or very soon, will get a survey in your inbox. Please, please, please fill it out, because it is, we, we so much wanted to make this event amazing. Should we ever do it again? Uh, we really want to know uh, what worked and what didn't work, what, what you liked, what you didn't like. Less Dan Galpin, maybe, you know. Um, second thing is um, uh, we, are gonna, we have these QR codes, which we might be able to put up one more time, hopefully. Um, and uh, th these are how you rate the sessions. And so we want to know what sessions you loved, what sessions you only liked, what sessions you sat through because they were there in the same room and you were, were kind of comfortable in your seat. Um, so please also fill out these surveys and let us know what worked. I know it's a lot of work, but I really appreciate that. And uh, ultimately, if you missed anything, all of these talks are actually up today. Well, Right now, OK, well, I guess that's gone. Um, all the talks that we have are up on the Android Developers YouTube channel. And, uh, and so again, I think and, uh, from yesterday, and most of them from today are already going up. Uh, and by, I think, the end of tonight, all of them will be up on the channel. So you'll be able to even go home tonight. If you haven't had enough Android Dev Summit by now, uh, you can even have more from the comfort of your very own history museum. Um, and, uh, and finally, we have a little bit of a final reel here um, of just some of what was going on here that we'll, we'll, ha we sh we'll share to you as, uh, as you think about uh, wandering out here and going back to the real world. So thank you so much for coming again. Welcome to the 2018 Android Developer Summit. This is an event for developers by developers. With over two billion devices, three quarters of a trillion apps downloaded every year, Android's developer community is growing hugely. We saw it more than double just in the past few years. So the Android App Bundle makes it much simpler. With no additional developer work needed, the App Bundle now makes apps an average of 8% smaller to download for M Plus devices. We simply could not do this without you, so thank you.
Whether you're just starting out on your journey toward a career in Android development, or you've been working as an Android developer for some time, you might ask yourself, how can I separate myself from the pack and get recognized? Introducing the Associate Android Developer Certification by Google, an achievement available to those who can display the skills of an entry-level Android developer. The first step on your journey is determining if you're ready to take the exam. Start by learning what the exam covers. Review the skills that you'll need to demonstrate when taking the exam. Next, decide whether you need training or are ready to take the exam. Training is available online as well as in person. Also, training is available in some colleges and universities. When you're ready, sign up and take the exam. As part of the sign-up, you'll pay an exam fee. If you live in India, you will pay 6,500 rupee. If you live outside of India, you will pay $149 US. After you've signed up and paid the fee, you will download the exam and load it into Android Studio and begin. The exam is a timed performance-based assessment in which you'll implement new features and debug issues in an existing app. When you start the exam, you'll have 24 hours to finish. And once you are done, you will submit the exam for grading. Your submission will be evaluated through a combination of machine and human grading. Based on the outcome of machine grading, you will move on to the exit interview. After you've finished and you've passed your interview, you will then receive a mark from Google and join our community of Google certified associate Android developers. Once you are certified, you can share your mark on your resume, LinkedIn, G+, Twitter, and in your email signature. We introduced Android Go Edition last year with the aim to bring the latest Android improvements to more entry-level phone buyers. There are now more than 200 Android Go devices available in over 120 countries. These devices are not only popular in emerging markets such as India and Brazil and Mexico, but in the United States as well. With more than 100 manufacturers planning to release devices before the end of the year, this is truly a global opportunity for your apps to reach a wider audience. Fundamentally, the Android Go Edition experience is based on three key pillars. Storage, delivering twice the out-of-box data storage compared to similarly configured non-Go Edition Android devices. Data management, helping users minimize their data consumption with features such as choosing content quality in YouTube Go. And security, offering the same security features as Android 9, such as Find My Device and malware protection with Google Play Protect. Let's take a closer look at how you can optimize your apps for Android Go. Start by targeting the most recent Android API. At the time of publishing this video, that's Android Pie API 28. This enables you to gain benefits such as improved memory use, while helping your apps run more efficiently on devices with one gigabyte of RAM or less. There's a clear correlation between lower app size and higher install rates. This is especially important for Android Go Edition users, as they have limited storage capacity and may incur download data charges. Therefore, keep your app under 40 megabytes and your game under 65 megabytes. The simplest and most impactful thing you can do to reduce your app size is to start using an Android app bundle. Developers using an app bundle have seen size savings of up to 65%. This works because Google Play uses your Android app bundle to build and serve APKs that are optimized for each device configuration. This results in a smaller app download for end users by removing unused code and resources needed for other devices. Additional optimizations you can do to reduce your app size are Replace PNG or JPEG files with HEIF or WebP assets. For vector graphics, use vector drawables. Replace raw audio format resources, such as WAVE, with MP3 or AAC resources. Remove duplicate libraries and, whenever possible, focus on mobile optimized libraries. Shrink and optimize your unused code and resources with tools such as ProGuard. You can use the APK Analyzer in Android Studio or from the command line to help understand how these optimizations impact your APK size. Another thing to check is your app's proportional set size or PSS. Now this is your app's physical memory footprint that accounts for both shared and unshared pages used by your app. You can easily check this using ADB Shell, Dumpsys, Meminfo. Aim for PSS RAM usage below 50 megabytes for apps and below 150 megabytes for games. And of course, make sure your app functions without ANRs and crashes by testing and double-checking on Android Go Edition powered devices. 
after making the optimizations, it's time to publish. Now, one question you might have is, do I deliver the same app to all my users or specifically target an optimized version of the app to users of Android Go Edition? For most developers, we recommend publishing the same app to all devices for those who are using Android and those who are using Android Go Edition. By optimizing your app to run well on Android Go Edition devices, all your users stand to gain from the performance benefits. Another option is to publish two separate apps, your existing app and a light app that is focused on Android Go Edition devices. You can target certain countries with a light app, or you can target all devices in all locales. It's up to you. Now, distributing a second app isn't a decision to be taken lightly. You'll need to support and maintain its code separately and dedicate resources to growing and engaging a second audience alongside your existing app. As we mentioned at the start of the video, Android Go is a tremendous opportunity for you to grow your app or game business. To learn more, check out the resources listed in the video description, including the Building for Billions guidelines, where you will find more tips for using memory, power, and network bandwidth more efficiently in your apps. Thanks for watching. <laughs>